the recording paused on that first session. So I'm gonna have to go back and do that transfer. Like an idiot. So this swing five years stuff. I would just in case. I'd probably I don't think it'll bog it down. We ended up coming back to the hotel and just sleeping. And, uh, but yesterday we went to Georgetown, which is about an hour away in the mountains. And they have an old mining train, a small track train, so you could do the loop and ride from Georgetown up to the mine. And we rented up to do that. Was neat. Yes, Well, 
Here it is, Danny. Yeah, just just do this. Is that it? Anybody in the hallway here? Oh, okay. Anybody still in the front of the seat? No. Okay. You should see the zoom at the bottom of my thing. Okay, I'll get started. Um, so Corey and I have done this for about five years now, and every year it's gotten better, and every course has gotten better because we've talked about new. Um, Corey will come up with some type of guide design. He'll we'll work on uh, the case together. I'll try it out surgically, give him some feedback, and then you know for the past past five years where we are right now, that it's never been better. Somebody brought up a you know stackable guides. Um, we tried it for a while, didn't really like it. And what he's doing right now is the best that we've done. Um, easiest approach for guide design and surgical implementation. So both to work up a case and actually do it. So we'll talk about, you know, for a while we we're just talking about guided surgery. And then once we got to the guided surgery, we were doing conventional methods for uh, con conversions and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But tomorrow we're going to focus on mostly staying digital without taking final impressions if that's where your workflow will take you eventually. I think you know, with the meta scan software and technology that's out, right, out there right now, the full arch is, is hard surgically, but it can be even more difficult prosthetically. And you know, uh, it can kind of get out of hand. And if you just want to have better lab communication with whoever you're working with, it's it's best to get a firm workflow with you know, you know, whatever lab you're gonna work with work with. So um, I'm Implant Diplomat on Instagram. You go to implantsblackweb.weebly. We teach a course twice a year at our office. It's not full arch guided. It's single tooth implant. That's what my uncle and I, um, all proceeds go to uh, a dental mission trip um, that we take uh, our um, the dental students from LSU School of Dentistry on once a year. So we, we teach a course, all the proceeds go to fund the mission trip. And then most recently, I started like a little small uh, a lab that helps support some of the stuff that you're interested in a little bit. So my education was I, I graduated from uh, LSU in New Orleans in 2007. I was part of the whole Katrina class. I was actually studying for an implant final exam. And uh, a medical student came over to my house and said we should evacuate. There's a hurricane coming. So I turn on the news because I, I wasn't watching TV and I realized how bad the hurricane was going to be. We get on the interstate and it took us an hour and a half to go three miles. The, the traffic was horrible. So I turned around, went back home, studied till three o'clock in the morning. That's whenever the hurricane was, was hitting. It was approaching land at like 4 a.m. 
Uh, he came back over my house by that time the interstates were closed. They were open, both uh, going outbound. So the inbound going outbound. So we got in my car and had a little Mercury Sable and we drove on that outbound trying to get out of town. And every time the wind gust would hit the side of my car on the, um, on the bridge, it would take us over into the next lane. And then I would drive back over and then a wind gust would come and take us over the next lane. And then the next morning I woke up and our dental school was flooded. It was completely shut down. The entire electrical panel was 10 feet underwater. I didn't have a school and uh, I was living at my parents' house. My house that I was renting, we had some, uh, uh, what do you call it when people just go to your house and live? I can't remember the name, squatters. We had a grandfather, grandmother, a mom, and a dad living in our house when I got back uh, three weeks later. They were eating out of my pots and pans and sleeping in my bed. It was kind of weird. Uh, we didn't kick them out because I had a place to stay. I was staying in my parents' house. Um, I just asked them to uh, didn't have to pay the rent. Um, anyway, long story short, after graduation, um, I didn't feel like I had enough uh, education and I wanted to do a, a general practice residency. So I got into Brookdale Hospital's one year GPR in Brooklyn, New York. So I went from New Orleans to Brooklyn. Plus I was dating this girl that I really didn't like that much. She wanted to get married and I, I wanted like the fastest exit strategy out of that relationship. So I figured moving across the country was the best way to break up the relationship. <clears throat> um, so I moved to New York and uh, you know, it's funny because when I moved to New York, there was like the, it, the residents in my class, one was Russian, one guy was Puerto Rican. Uh, some, there was a girl that was, um, Chinese, there was another girl that was uh, Indian and I was from Louisiana and I, and, I, and I told him one day, I said, I really can't understand anything what you guys say. Everybody has a really strong accent. And they all started laughing. They said, I had the accent. <laughs> so, uh, but it was interesting because the, you know, in New York and the, and the average income for an individual was $60,000 and there was 11 million people living in New York City. And after I graduated my one year GPR, I stayed on for another two years to do an implantology fellowship. So for two years, all I did was place and restore implants. You had chin grafts, hip grafts, tibia grafts, spinal implantations, you know, anything you could think of, we would try out on these patients. Um, and then after the residency, you know, I was kind of like a dime a dozen. There was a lot of good implantology people in there and it was a super saturated market. So we looked around, my wife and I at the time, she wanted to move out of the city. And uh, we looked at going back to my hometown, but the combined income in my hometown was only $45,000. There's 150,000 in greater Lafayette. And I thought, man, I could, I know how to do, you know, implants and placement and restore them to the best level possible. But how are people going to afford it? So, you know, and especially if you get into a full arch rehab, the cost can get extremely expensive. If you, you know, if you itemize the ADA codes for every extraction, every bone graft, you know, charge out for PRF, charge out for surgical guide, you know, the cost just gets astronomical. So, you know, getting into full arch dentistry, it was all about cost savings and time savings. If there's anything that I can do on my end to make the surgical procedure faster, I can be more efficient in the operatory, then guided surgery might lend a hand to that. You know, Corey and I met about six years ago. Uh, we actually met eight or 10 years ago at a course he took in Lafayette and uh, at my uncle's office. Um, and then, you know, two years after that, we met in Nashville and he was telling me he was doing a lot of guided surgery cases. And I thought, you know what, man, I appreciate you mentioning it to me, but it's expensive for for guides, you know, at that time it was like 800 bucks for a surgical guide. And it took like two to three weeks for the guide to come in through the mail. And then uh, I've had a couple guys that I didn't like. Well, then he told me about Blue Sky Bio Plan and uh, strongly urged me to get into it. And uh, after talking, to, talking with him, um, I thought there's no way I would ever plan my own case. I don't think it's worth my time. 
And so in the, now the past six years, all I've been doing is lecturing on telling people to, you know, design their own guides because I've seen the advantages of surgical guide design. So what I'll pretty much go over is the cost savings that you'll implement in your office. If you can streamline your practice and the time saving you'll have in the surgical operatory and also in the restorative aspect. You know, I used to, I used to schedule four to five hours to take upper and lower and final impressions, mount my models in the lab and do all this kind of stuff. You know, I think now we schedule an hour for record appointments and you know, patients are in and out the chair. We have a really good system. Everything's super, super efficient. Um, Corey and I just did a full arch guide upper and lower um, on an edentulous patient. The surgical time was one hour and 45 minutes for upper and lower with fixed provisionals. And I'll show you that case later in the day tomorrow. Um, this image was found on a, a website. If you Google full arch hybrid, this image will pop up on a famous education website. Anybody see anything wrong with the spinal prosthesis? And, you know, it's, it's highly posture. It looks pretty, it looks nice. And at first glance, you kind of you kind of think, you know, it's pretty cool. They did it all on four, right? It looks good. But, you know, the implants in 29 area and 27 area are not in an ideal position, right? And if this was the, the maxillary anterior, that wouldn't be an ideal position to get a screw axis roll. This case was not done guided. That's obvious. And so the lab has to be able to fix this to make it more ideal with either angle screw channels or creating a little, what Corey calls like a cancer on the, on the buckle, the buckle defect. But this is no longer hygienic for this patient, right? And you're not gonna see any of my cases that look like this and I'll show you. You know, hundreds of cases in the next few days. But I think as a whole, we can do better for our patients and have better results, better final results with this. Yeah, he does have a surgical success, but the prosthetic success is not there. And so for the rest of that patient's life, you're gonna have to remove that prosthesis, take it out to clean around those implants and then put it back in. There is no expense in your office that can justify the cost of your time to go in to take out these composites, pop out the Teflon, unscrew this prosthesis, have the hygienist clean it, for you to put it back in, put new screws, put new Teflon and torque it all out. It's a huge pain and I don't do it in my practice because the, the final prosthesis are all ovate and hygienic, right? And, and you know, I'll get a question every once in a while. So if you do have to take it out, how much do you charge patients? And my, my response is usually, if you do a three unit fixed bridge, we just prep in 13, 14 japonic and 15. How many times do you take that three unit bridge out to clean it for your patients? The answer is you never do, you never do. So why would we do that for full arch when it's harder and more difficult? Why don't we just plan the cases properly initially so we get better prosthetic results so we don't have to do that, right? This is an actual live patient that came to my office. This was in 2019. She had had these implants restored two and a half, three months ago. This is the bone around the implants. You can see on the distal on the lower on both sides. And the maximum in the mandible. This is that final prosthesis for this patient. This is the maxillary buccal flange. This is the mandibular lingual and mandibular distal buccal flange. So that's the, the buccal on the left and on the right is the lingual. <clears throat> this was the x-ray. So already we know that prosthetically, she's getting food into this thing 24-7. It's always having food. She does have a speech impediment. Look at the distal angled implant. Uh, you can see my mouse right here. This is the inferior alveolar nerve down here. There's 25 millimeters between the distal angled implant and the inferior alveolar nerve. 
There's no reason to distal angle this implant at all. In fact, she has so much bone, the implant should be way back here and way back here to avoid the cantilevers. There was no pre-op planning for this case. This was a flat drill, put your implants in. Now these implants, if you go back to this, this photo, these implants are all, you know, platform uh, switched implants with like 0 0.3 millimeters circumferentially. So they can be placed subcrestal, at least a millimeter or something like that. But if you also notice from this, look how much bone volume she has, look how much height she has. Now, the restorative components are a miss. Does anybody see, or what jumps out at you with that much bone in the restorative components? There's no space. So on top of the implant, you're gonna put a multi-unit abutment, three to four millimeters. And then on top of that, you're gonna have a four millimeter bar. And then on, that, on top of that, you're gonna put your prosthesis. So you're already seven to eight millimeters on top of your implant that's super crestal. And if this is an FP3, we, we know we need another, you know, we need 15 millimeters total, right? We've already eaten up seven and they're gonna do a denture uh, acrylic on top of that. So this was her bite. So, so she's got a very small mouth. You can see I'm trying to put retractors in to take a photo, but I can't because she's got a tiny mouth. And I unscrewed the bottom and this is the bottom arch. This has been in her mouth for three months, three months. The dentist put he didn't put three to four millimeter multi-unit abutments. He put six millimeter multi-unit abutments. And these multi-unit abutments are outside the tissue crest. So you see this? This is a distal angled implant, a 17 degree outside the soft tissue. This is six millimeters. And all it is is covered in, in you know, plaque and chartering calculus. But these are four millimeters outside the soft tissue. A complete prosthetic disaster. And this was not an immediate load situation. Wrong, wrong restorative components. I mean, there's no planning at all. And this, is, this was done in 2019. This is not that old of a case. This is her denture made concave. <clears throat> so, you know, I, she came to me and she said, I got a mortgage on my second house. I got a mortgage on my house, second mortgage on my house to be able to afford this, these implants, these procedure. I have $50,000 in my mouth right now. And she said, I need somebody to fix it. I want to sue him. And I was like, well, I don't want to see you. <laughs> She's like, I want to sue him, but that's not who I am. I just want him to be honest with me. But he kicked me out of the practice because I was always complaining about the process. He said, there's nothing else I can do for you. So she came to me and she said, I have no money. And I'd like for you to fix it for me. And I was like, <laughs> Again, I don't even know how I really want to treat you. <laughs> but I was concerned about the implants and the bone loss for only three months of integration. So the idea was, look, let me just do this because it's completely unhygienic and you're miserable. So let me take everything out. I'm going to put in locator abutment snaps. I'm going to store you with it. I'll take your denture and convert it to upper and lower implant supported over denture so you can pop them out and clean around these areas. And then in a year to two years, we'll come back say, look, these implants are good, these implants are bad, take some out, keep some, and, and, and then eventually go back and fix if that's what you want to do. This is her upper arch. There's, this is way too far outside of the soft tissue. So upper final prosthesis. This cost her $10,000. This final prosthesis cost $10,000. Upper and lower after finish. So what I'm getting at is, again, this was two years ago, but technology has been out for six years. Corey and I have been lecturing about this for six years. There's, she should have had a bone reduction guide on the lower. Her implants should have had a better AP spread. The prosthetic components should have been completely different. The final, the final prosthetic shouldn't have been a denture over on top of multi-unit buttons that are super tall. Like everything is wrong with that case. 
right? It's a complete nightmare for that lady. And she spent $50,000 for it. I'm just saying you could do better and we could all do better as a whole. And that's why Corey and I have been lecturing about guided surgery for so long. And I've been a huge advocate of guided surgery and pre-op planning. So with that said, Corey and I have teamed up and I've learned a lot from him. One thing I've learned is uh, when he goes fishing, he wears his Sunday's best button down plaid shirt. He got it from Walmart for $5. Um, his brother-in-law gave him some camo pants. They were hand-me-downs, so it didn't cost him anything. But these Bluetooth headphones were 300 bucks. <laughs> Walmart Wranglers. <clears throat> Corey turned me on to that a couple of years ago. If you learn anything from this course, Walmart sells Wranglers and it's the nicest, most comfortable $20 pants I own. And I have, my wife hates them. She bought me a pair of Lululemons and I returned them to go get Walmart Wranglers. So graduating residency, this was the first full arch case that I did. And I'll go through a step-by-step -step protocol of how I was thinking post-graduation for a case like this. This is not your average case, it was a little bit more difficult, but we'll start off with this and then go to from non-guided to guided, right? So I'm only gonna talk about one non-guided case, that was mine. 58 year old patient, she lost her teeth 30 years ago. She hates her lower denture, doesn't wear it. She can't chew. She gained a lot of weight and she wants implants, right? So initially, when you look in her mouth, this is the photo that I took. What are a couple of different things that pop out of your head? Immediately, what do you see? What are gonna be some pitfalls and some advantages of what you're seeing right now? Tall ridge. Keratinized tissue, very thin keratinized tissue. We just have keratinized tissue right at the ridge. And this is the mucogingival junction right here at the ridge. What else? Friend and muscle pull, possibly thin ridge, maybe need some, some grafting, something like that. What about the tongue? Massive, massive tongue, right? She's been wearing a denture. She, she hasn't been wearing a lower denture and her tongue's huge for 30 years. 30 years is boom, right? So soft tissue considerations is uh, soft tissue deficiency in the mandibular anterior, and she's got a, a labial muscle pull on both sides. And prosthetic considerations are mucogingival defect and her extremely large tongue. So we, and look, we'll talk about prosthetic issues and surgical issues. So the issues that you see in this Panorex are obviously there's an uneven restorative plane. I'm not gonna place, and I have seen people place implants um, or, are at the crest here and then at the crest here, right? So then your final prosthetic is gonna look like a wave. Um, so obviously there's gonna be some either augmentation of the posterior or reduction of the anterior, right? And all that's gonna be driven by what? The surgical phase or the prosthetic phase? Prosthetic phase. Prosthetic phase drives this whole case. So posterior ridge deficiency, that's completely evident on the panorex, uneven restorative plane, that's our prosthetic, prosthetic considerations. And now we have something else to deal with. She is severe class three, right? So she had her teeth taken out 30 years ago. She's been wearing an upper denture. Her, her maxilla has been restored. She probably wasn't even, you know, edge to edge or even class three beforehand. Now we have a 59 degree class three patient and there is a 20 millimeter offset just from the crest of the anterior ridge, not counting uh, you know, the chin. And how do you account for that in prosthetic reconstruction? So <clears throat> if it's removable, we treat it one way. If it's fixed, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult and it's gonna have to be treated a different way. And prosthetically, it's all about bike re reconstruction issues. So obviously at now we need a CT, CT scan. So this is a CT scan measured. So this is about our midpoint right here. Let's just say that's like 26 area. 
And this is the cross-sectional. So for the first 11.7 millimeters, it's severe atrophic bone until we get to this point where we have some intermedullary bone and it's only 4.2 millimeters. And we know we need at least five millimeters for a three toe diameter implant. So I'm gonna to have to go past 12 millimeters if I'm gonna reduce this bone, that seems like a large reduction, or I'm gonna to have to I'm going to have to have, figure out how to increase the bone volume with surgical correction. Again, more slices of this severe atrophic, pretty much the entire anterior mandible. So atrophic, either grafting or, bo or bone reduction, and then restorative components. How are we going to restore this? If we graft it, what restorative components are we going to use? Am I going to go direct to implant or use multi abutments or custom abutments? And then treatment plan options, implant size, sizes, obviously. And do I want cross arch stability um, for this case? And she wants fixed. So if I spend the money, I want to, I want to have fixed. She couldn't afford it, but she was the maid of the mother whose son started Miracle Grow. So this guy, who's at the time he was 50 years old, he started Miracle Grow. Sold this company for it was I don't know you can Google it. It's like $50 million dollars, he moves to Hawaii. He hires this lady to be a full-time caregiver for his mother. She just happens, happens to be living in the town. And she wanted to pay for uh, her work. So um, surgical corrections. So all these issues that we've had of substitute deficiency, posterior ridge deficiency, they're all gonna have surgical corrections, right? Graft or soft tissue grafts, or we're gonna use short implants for posterior or graft those areas. Uh, Skeletal class three, how do we fix this? Pro surgically, so we can help ourselves prosthetically, atrophic manipular interior, graft or surgical correction, implant size and sizes. And I'm always about key implant sites. I don't like having two implants here in, you know, in 19 and 20, and our next implants can be in 23. So that whole area is gonna be a long span bridge. I prefer every other or shorter bridges, um, trying to keep what's and prosthetic uh, reconstruction. She obviously has a severe mucoderminal gingival defect. So am I gonna harvest tissue from the palate or am I gonna use alloderm or what am I gonna, what am I gonna do to increase the soft tissue? Level, level the, the plane, fix the bite reconstruction by facial concepts, you use transmucosal components versus direct to implant. And then uh, am I gonna use breakers or cross arch to be stable? So these are my implants. These are all 3.8 millimeter diameter. These were uh, blue sky. I'm sorry. These are bio horizons when I was placing bio horizons back in the day. Straight out of residency. And this accounts for the implant when the 3.8 millimeter diameter implant is just in bone. The neck of, or the head or the implant abutment junction is just encased in bone, but doesn't have 1.5 millimeter circumferentially around the implant. So at this point, I know I need to remove seven millimeters of bone just to get to the implant being bottom out, but I need to go half 1.5. So it's gonna to have to be another four to five millimeters below that. This is all my implants in cross section. This is a, a 4.6 by nine millimeter implant and 30. And you see all the cross sections on the left side. This is the implant. Again, it needs to go further down because I don't have 1.5 millimeters on the buccal or the lingual. And you'll see that across all these implants in the anterior. And then back to my implant number 19. This implant in 19 site, very thin buccal bone. I want it to be two millimeters away from the, for the inferior alveolar nerve. Obviously this is a non-guided case. So I'd be careful with my implant depth, drilling protocol, and make sure I got uh, this implant to lock in. So day of surgery, Soft tissue is on my mind. So my incision is gonna be a mid crestal incision. I'm gonna to have to remove bone. I'm gonna to have to have adequate uh, buccal flap reflection without tearing the flap. So this is my full thickness flap. I use a 15 C blade uh, at the crest of the ridge all the way across from 19 to 30. One blade at one time, the depth of bone all the way across the arch. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a molt curette. Does anybody have a molt curette? It's called multi four. I use that with a back end scoop to reflect the lingual tissue, then start to reflect the, the buccal tissue. If you take a gauze, a sterilized gauze, if you take the gauze and you enter it in the uh, 
uh, it has to lay on keratinized tissue. So if you enter it right here in this area and you take the gauze and you press it against bone and you push down, it'll actually flap reflect for you. Pretty neat little procedure. I might have a video for you later. Um, but it's a quicker way for flap reflection. And then, um, but once you do this, once you remove bone like this, you lose all of your landmarks. You don't have teeth to have landmarks. The only landmark you have is your middle nerve, right? So I can go into my CT scan, read my middle nerve, measure the, measure the amount of height, measure that in the mouth, measure that on CT scan, cross it, and I'll go across the arch and I'll burr out little tiny holes on the facial aspect after I keep getting my measurements. Right, I'll go to the CT scan, how many millimeters I need, 12 millimeters, go in there, measure 12 millimeters with a bullet gauge, drill a hole in the buccal aspect, and then continue that all the way from uh, the left side all the way to the right side, middle nerve to middle nerve. And then I'll connect all those uh, buccal perforations with a burr. And then I have my bone contour to depth. So you can start to see, I have medul intermedullary bone here, this is still dense cortical bone in the posterior, still a little atrophic. That's the bone that I removed. You can start to see in the, in the intaglio aspect, you can see the intermedullary bone starting to show up. But look how dense cortical that bone is. There's no grafting this bone and getting predictable results. So I'm gonna remove the bone, level out the restricted plane, get and lower the, if I lower it, it's gonna increase the distance between the mandible to the maxilla. So I'm gonna have more room to change her from a class three relationship into a class one. Does that make sense? With restricted components in mind. That's approximate the width. And I did the, I obviously did the best I could to place my four implants in between. You can see the middle nerve here reflected. So I, I did four osteotomies. This was my fourth one, but I got real thin on the buckle. So I drilled another osteotomy here and I placed four implants in the mandibular anterior. This is a 3.8 by, I think it was 15, another 3.8 by 15, 3.8 by 12, 3.8 by 12. And these were, I mean, this, this, this case was in 2010. So these are non-platform switched implants. Um, obviously I would do a lot of things different from there to now. These are my implants in the posterior. Remember that site number 19 that was real thin on the buckle and had dense cortical bone? I have a, a buckle fracture here instead of graft this buckle defect. Now, if, if soft tissue is on my mind and, and you know I got the implants in, now it's time to suture, I, I want to increase the band of keratinized tissue around my implants. So she started out with two to 2.5 millimeters of keratinized tissue at the crest. And in residency, well, you know, I, everybody, everybody will relate to this. You take a tooth out and you leave it alone. And if you have a band of keratinized tissue on the, on the facial aspect and a band of keratinized tissue on the lingual aspect, what fills in? Keratinized tissue. I mean, that's classic perio literature. If you have a band of keratinized tissue on that facial aspect and a band of, of mucoperiosteal tissue on the lingual aspect, what fills in? Anyone know? Which grows faster? It's actually a 50-50 mix. Mucoperiosteal tissue will actually grow a little bit faster, but typically it's about 50-50, keratinized to mucoperiosteal tissue. Um, if you have mucoperiosteal and mucoperiosteal tissue, you don't get keratinized tissue, right? So the split thickness dissection of the, of the keratinized tissue on the ridge from 2.5 millimeters was split in half, and I left on the, on the lingual aspect, keratinized tissue, on the facial aspect, you know, millimeter and a quarter, of keratinized tissue. And I'm not gonna lay alderm across the entire arch and hope she doesn't wear a denture and it, you know, the alderm didn't fail. I'm not, and I'm not gonna take her entire soft palate and lay it down on the ridge to recreate keratinized tissue. So I'm all about non-surgical soft tissue augmentation to enhance um, implant restorative long-term success. And I'll show you that in this case and for the next two days, that's my biggest deal. What I did was I suture with interrupted Gore-Tex. I don't use Gore-Tex anymore, this is a long time ago, but, and I, I sutured around each one of these prefabricated abutments, right? And I left 
this area exposed for secondary intent healing. So if I had keratinized tissue on the buckle and I had keratinized tissue on the lingual, it should fill in keratinized tissue. If the patient wasn't wearing a denture for 30 years, her lower denture, so she's not gonna wear it anymore. I'm just gonna have her stay on a liquid diet, anti-inflammatory analgesics for the next couple of days. This is my post-op CT scan in site number 30. You can see free hand, it's decent. Obviously, you don't, they're not perfectly aligned, upper and lower. Not, what, not the results I'm getting now when I'm doing guided, for sure. This is the implant angle. This is bone here, 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 and 19 today. If you look, they're cover screws, yeah. Uh, it came, uh, prefabricated abutments came with the implants. That's how you, that's how you deliver the implant. You can see on these photos, the implant driver was engaged into the prefabricated button. That's just how it, the implant system. Now they've gotten rid of these because nobody really uses them anymore. Um, but these these could also be used as the final but final button. You can see it. That's I think it was like two one point five millimeters from the from this um, shoulder. You can kind of see them placing a little subcrestal in the bone, um, even though they're platform matching implants. <clears throat> um, and, and all I did was use those prefabricated abutments just to suture around to get the tissue tight around them. And then once it relaxed, I removed them and I let it heal by secondary intent. Does that make sense? So uh, from the anterior loop, I'm five millimeters roughly. This is all done freehand, two millimeters away from the, the nerve on both sides. And this is seven millimeters, so plenty of room. You can see I've lowered, got her into um, a better position. Now she has time to heal. And the clinical significance of soft tissue graft, and there's a guy named Gary Greenstein and John Cavalier. Does anybody know him? Uh, Gary Greenstein is a, a periodontist in New Jersey, and John Cavalier is a prosthodontist in uh, Brooklyn. And they write together on all their papers. If, if you could go into PubMed and put their names in, download every article they've ever written, that's like a mini residency in itself. They teach, they taught me at NYU. They're incredible. All they taught, did talk. So Gary is like this, Gary's like a, like a, a mad scientist. He, he doesn't, his weekends are spent reading literature and uh, thumbing through articles and then trying to write articles himself based on uh, current past uh, research. That's just what he does for fun. He doesn't like to barbecue. He doesn't like to work on old cars. He doesn't like to spend time with his wife or kids. That's what he likes to spend time on. He's a, he's a fantastic guy. And John Cavallaro is just a, he's a gregarious prosthodontist and, and he enjoys writing with, with Gary Greenstein. One of, the, one of the papers they wrote after I graduated residency was the uh, statistically significant better results in the presence of keratinized tissue, tissue as compared to unkeratinized tissue for long-term success for implants. Um, the data was interrupted to indicate that some patients may need augmentation of keratinized tissue to maintain peri-implant health. All that to say is what we all now know, you need a band of keratinized tissue just completely surrounding your implants for better long-term success. And that has everything to do with bone. So if you, if you have the bone, you need the soft tissue. If you have the soft tissue, you need the bone. They work hand in hand, right? It, you, you can't have this big, broad band of bone and not have any keratinized tissue because you're going to have bone loss and, and thread it quickly on your own. Um, they went on to state, you know, long-term maintenance for those areas uh, around implant success. So this is her post-op instructions. I'm not gonna immediately load anything, um, no smoking. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do the same procedure, but if you want to immediate load and still get long-term success. Um, it, you know, there's different levels. Some guys can take this course and they, they placed, you know, 400 implants a month. Some some people can come take this course and they they place onesies and twosies, maybe two a month. And so I, we'll go through different levels of of uh, restoring surgical protocols and things like that. Just work within your comfort zone. I, I yeah yeah I, I would I would absolutely. I mean my comfort zone was this staged approach. And then as I got more comfortable with staged approach, I went on to grow into, um, you know, uh, uh, 
immediate loading and a, and a mandible with good sound strong bone when the patient has an opposing denture right and it, you know I, I crawled before i walked but it, you know it's kind of interesting because Corey and i would get emails after courses and somebody will send us a patient they have no bone and the bone's all weak and they want to uh, take out all the teeth play six implants do the conversion um and that it's their first case that they've ever done. Yeah. So um, obviously I would recommend the same, you know. So swelling modifications, usually, usually now that I IV sedate these patients for this type of procedure, and I'll give Decatron an IV, and Toral an IV. So usually post-op swelling is really not significant at all. Patients, most of the patients don't ever complain. I think I've had one patient in the past two years that ever complained about post-op or discomfort. So this is healing at 12 weeks. Look at the band of keratinized tissue on my ridge. I was real, a little bummed out at, at an implant site number 30, I had a perforation because I'll lose some of that connective tissue attachment that's already perforated, right? If I could, I could, if I could have like, this is a 4.5 millimeter implant. So if I could have like some soft tissue of 4.5 millimeters and split that and push that out, I'd have more, more keratinized tissue around that implant. So now I'm gonna, have, I'm, now I'm, gonna I'm gonna expose these implants. I'm gonna make a make press incision for exposure um, to uncover and make sure I don't have any of my implants healed. So all I did was made a, made an incision and placed on these healing abutments and I stretched the tissue out on both sides, right buccal lingual. So this is after three months or 14 weeks of healing. Yep. Taking a, this is the old school way of taking an open tray impression, verifying it. Look at the soft tissue profile at this area. Again, I, I've done nothing surgically besides Soft tissue technique, that's it. This is a beautiful band of keratinized tissue. I think everybody would agree. So this is a four millimeter diameter implant and I have three millimeters in the facial aspect, two millimeters on the, on the lingual aspect. And look at this, look at this compared to this area right here that I didn't have an implant. I didn't push soft tissue around. I just got primary closure right there. That's where we started from. This is where we're at right now. And this can be done for every single implant that you place in your practice. So I was, I was, very, 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 very frugal back in the day. And I would uh, wax up my own bars. So I used to advocate to wax up your own bars and, and send it off to labs. Cause if you get a lab to, uh, you know, mill a bar for you back in the day, it was like $2,500. If you got a lab to um, wax and cast a bar for you, it was about 15 to $1,800. If you got a lab to cast your bar for you, it was like 300 something dollars. I was casting, I was, I was waxing up my own bars, sending out to lab and having cast it for me. So this is the uh, lab that actually did the casting for me and pressed the teeth. I, I forgot what lab this was. This is before I was open bourbon and in the back. And we made a screw retained direct to implant, non-hexed uh, implant. So no multi-unit abutments, direct to fixture, right? And what I, what I failed to do was, um, what I, it was a, a silly mistake as an amateur, but I waxed to this implant. I didn't wax past this implant, right? So I, I, I can have, I mean, look at the AP spread from this molar to this molar all the way here. I could go back down to her throat with, you know, three more teeth, give her a wisdom teeth back. Um, but I waxed to this case, so they, they cast it to this and they can't leave it off this one tooth. This was day of delivery. This is a final occlusion. Smile up and lower. She went on to get her uppers finished. I want to move it out of that practice until I am right now. One year post op. This is now been her mouth for I think 13 years or something like that. Any complications I had from this um, because of the distal cantilever unsupported, I did have a fracture of that. So I just removed it from her mouth, polished off this corner, and put it back in. That was it. it was the only complication I had. So then again, fast forward to me meeting Corey and Corey advising me to get into guided designs for full arches. And again, I had tried several cases for full arches on a dentalist patients. It was so difficult to get a guide that was accurate if you, if you wanna do soft tissue guide, so hard. Corey was like, you know, even after we met in Nashville, 
I think him and I emailed back and forth and we were saying, Danny, I really think you should try a case. I think you should try a case. And I was like, all right, well, let's just try a case. This is uh, Scott Gans. I'm sure you guys have heard of him. He's been real big into um, guide design, but he talks about the significant improvements in accuracy, time efficiency, and reduction of surgical error, benefits for the patient, surgeon, restorative dentist, and the laboratory. Couldn't be more true how accurate guides are compared to free man. And then again, uh, comb beam topography assisted treatment planning concepts, the benefit of uh, CT technology, dental implant applications, increased for accuracy. There's, there's absolutely no comparison between my work that I've done freehand versus what I'm doing now with our surgical guides. And this is the first case Corey and I did together. It's the very first case we, him, him and I did together. So I sent him this after Nashville and I thought, um, it's a pretty difficult case. It reminded me of the case just prior, but he has a couple teeth in the anterior. Um, he's got advanced periodontal disease in these last couple teeth in his mouth. Obviously tooth number 21 and 22 are shot. Um, later to find out tooth number 27 was shot. I wasn't gonna keep four lower incisors um, and try to put implants for the posterior. He had no posterior bone back here on both sides, severe deficient ridges. So um, I, sent, I planned a case where I wanted to place my implants and the depth at which I wanted to place my implants to get a big, a, a nice, uh, even restorative plane. So it's Corey and Corey will show you good advanced bone segmentation is like the first step into this. If you don't know how to do this or you don't want to spend time on it, you can outsource it to a company in India called 3D Imaging and they'll do it for 50 bucks an arch. Um, you can even get the teeth segmented outside also for things like 100 bucks an arch. And, and they, it's a 12 hour turnaround. Um, but we did advanced bone segmentation. This is Corey's work. So he'll, you can digitally e extract these teeth in a mesh mixer. So you can just highlight them, select tool, and then extract all. And you're left with the teeth, the teeth gone and the bone with the uh, interproximal bone peaks, right? And you can make your guide or your bone reduction guide to get a level of restorative plane based on your implant position. So these are the posteriors, these are the anterior. So I'm going to reduce the bone in the uh, uh, inner foramen. You can use in mesh mixer. This was one technique we use. It's a little bit different now, but there's a thing called plane cut tool. You can take your bone, the STL, the advanced bone segmentation. Once you go from a diacom to advanced bone segmentation, it turns a diacom into an STL. You can export that STL, import it in the mesh mixer. And that 3D printable object can be, can be edited. So then through the edited version, you go into what's called plane cut tool, and that can put a level horizontal plane cut across your entire lower arch, right? And then you can also flip it to look at your implants below it to make sure you have enough space if you're placing subcrestal implants. Everybody okay? If I, if I get too fast, just let me know. This is, um, yeah. Um, again, my comfort zone wasn't fully guided yet. It was pilot drill guides and then going towards implants. So get my implants in the key positions for pilot drills before I uh, place my implants. Back in the day, I was using a cell row box. I don't use this anymore. If I recommend any 3D printer out in the market, I've, I have one, two, three um, sprint rays in the office and we have three sprint rays in the lab. If you're going to get a sprint ray, you should get the, the Pro 95 is the best bang for the buck on the market right now for provisionals, for models, and for surgical guides. And that they, they've come out with new resins recently where the surgical guides are a lot stronger because we're printing these. The, the default in um, Blue Sky Bio is a three millimeter thickness of your surgical guide. Right, and if you turn off undercuts or anything like that, you don't want to have any pressure on the guy because a while back they could fracture. But the new surgical guide two resin is a lot stronger after you cure it, so it's it's not as brittle and it won't fracture much. But I mean, you know, th these things are a fraction of the cost of you know I, I paid three dollars for these surgical guides to be printed in uh, in color fab in clear. Now I'm. Um, now these guides cost me like $5 an arch and the export from Blue Sky Bio Plan is 15 bucks for so a full arch surgical guide. I have $20 in my entire case before the, the patient is scheduled. 
right? Can you imagine sending off a case to the lab, having them plan the whole thing and the patient, you know, unfortunately pass away or decide they don't want to do the treatment anymore or they want to clear choice and they've got a better cost and now you're five to $7,000 into the lab bills. Um, so they have surgery, pretty much the same protocol as I showed you guys earlier. It's a full flap thickness reflection. Now you can better appreciate the bone loss on tooth number 27. Um, it was class two to three mobility. These are appreciating the middle node on both sides. This is the bone reduction guide in place. There's two ways to do this. One is remove the teeth individually, all right? And then place your guide and then reduce your bone, all right? So there's an ostectomy and osteotomy guide, right? Or what you could do is as your key reference. So I had um, undercuts in this cervical guide because I don't have lateral pins. Right, there's no lateral pins on this guide. Everybody know what a lateral pin is, right? Where you put your guide in and you, you put lateral pins so the lateral pins will hold the guide into place. I'll show you that later on. Um, this does not have lateral pins. So I'm gonna have to use the undercuts of the patient's bone. Do you have this guide? I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, this was like seven years ago or six years ago when we did this, but... Um, this guide was made so it would snap in the undercuts of the mandible. So I kept the teeth in place to, to be able to snap this guide in. And then when I removed the bone and teeth in one lop, then the guide would disengage. Is that right okay with that? And then all I have to do is just pop out the little, the teeth and then do root tips and then place my, my, uh, my surgical guide on top. So uh, this is a, just a real quick video, but um, if you're gonna use any surgical guides, I recommend a couple different things. Never use an air-driven surgical handpiece, even if it doesn't blow air in the surgical field. Uh, it doesn't have enough torque to cut through the bone. So I use an electric handpiece with uh, this liniment side cutting burr. And if you use a circle handpiece, you'll have to go through the buccal cortex first. You'll have to come back and cut through the roots, go back again, cut through the roots, and then go back again and cut through the lingual bone. It just takes too long. I don't like spending that much time. So you use a liniment burr, which is a side cutting burr. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, on an electric lingual handpiece to be able to cut through everything all at once. And then it's a side cutting burr. So if you touch the surgical guide, you'll remove the surgical guide because it's strong, right? So I'm off the surgical guide about half a millimeter to a millimeter roughly. And I'll come back with this KS7 burr, which is a diamond burr. That's actually Koi Spears crown prepper. And I'll come back and I'll smooth all the edges, uh, edges off. So, so this guide is a, is a, is a bone reduction guide. And, and afterwards you have a surgical guide that goes on top of the bone. So the bone has to com be completely level and completely be even. And this guide that's in the patient's mouth has to be fully seated on both sides so that if you do remove the bone and all in one, the, the second guide that sits on top won't be accurate if the bone has any spicules that are shooting off. Everybody okay with that? You can see me pop out this guide right here. See me? Those are the undercuts I was talking about. And then this is the KS7 bird coming on top of it, smooth it all out. So after um, I take out the bone, this is what I'm left with. I'm just gonna pop these out. These little root tips don't take much to pop out. This, the, the, that canine that was periodontally involved, it was uh, bifurcated. Um, it's been real difficult in there. So this is the bone that I removed with the teeth in one. So the ostectomy, the verse osteoplasty, pros and cons, um, both work. Um, with distal extension patients, teeth boring guides are completely different, right? So this is gonna be a bone guide, not a tooth boring guide. Um, I'll let you read this later on. 
So after that guide's taken out, we put our second guide in. Again, it doesn't have lateral lateral uh, pin guides, so it's gonna have to seat on the mandible. I'm just gonna use a pilot drill guide to go around my arch and then place my implants in. <clears throat> All these implants going in and then bone graft, PRF, suture. All right, but um, I didn't suture to the healing abutments like I showed you guys last time. This is a little bit different. So on the second stage uncovery, I'm gonna have to uncover this, but be, be more aggressive about my uncovery because I didn't I didn't keep the, the tissue exposed around those healing bones. All right, 60 days of healing. This was my comfort zone six years ago. If I'm I'm doing all this work, I was you know a little stressful or uh, hadn't done it before. So I was making sure that I had the surgical aspect and the implants integrate before I go on to restorative phase and not immediate load. Six, 16, what is that? 16 days, three months of healing, a decent band of keratinitis tissue, but not, not very good. They have exposure, I'm gonna remove the, you know, bones obviously healed really well. That's what the bone looks like, even after that aggressive surgery of removing the bone. Um, these are some, some articles about soft tissue regeneration for post-op clinical monitoring of soft tissue and wound healing. Um, and all that, all this says is um, um, basically what I've talked about a little bit. These are only two articles I could find about soft tissue surgical regeneration around these. So day of uncovery after he's been healing for three months. Um, this was way long time ago, and I exposed him like this, um, and I let him walk out, walk out the door. And I, with, I don't, I've only done this one time just to try it out to see what happened. I want to see how much keratinized tissue. This is after four days of healing. And this is after 12, uh, 10 weeks of healing. You can see the soft tissue thickness that I was able to gain by secondary healing intent. I would advise not letting your patients walk out the door like this. Um, if you do keep it exposed this much, it's best to put PRF on top of the ridge and then you'll have less morbidity for your patients and faster, prettier healing time. And you don't have, see this little, uh, this little surgical incision line? You can even see it here. With PRF, I don't see scarring in my uh, cases. So PRF really does a very good job of soft tissue healing. I did have an early fail failure, so I removed the implant. And so this, is a, this was a, a 4.6 by seven millimeter diameter implant that BioHorizons was, um, making at the time, they, they have since stopped making this implant because they had such a high rate of failure. Um, they changed the design of the implant. And um, I, I don't know if, I haven't been placing their implants for it at all. I don't know if that's been better, but um, I switched this implant out um, for a, a more aggressive implant here. This one wound up failing too later on in the, the case, just because he had such poor bone in the posterior mandible. I tried to place this implant with no success. Wound up finishing the case off with five implants instead of six. But, but all that to say, look at the band of, of keratinized tissue around these implants. And it, it was only just a surgical modification. It, it wasn't anything, um, you know, no alderm, no palate. You can do a lot of this with just uh, suturing techniques and flat dissections or split thickness dissections or adding PRF around your implants and suturing techniques. This is when I was mounting models. I was trying different things, mounting with on locator attachments. I advise not doing this, but I do pour up model models. If I do take an impression, but I don't take any impressions anymore. Um, I don't send models. I don't send impressions to the lab. I send models to the lab if, back in the day. So I like I like ginger fast was my favorite material back in the day. I would mount everything on a stratus articulator, a pinned in articulator. Get it back with the custom abutment design, the provisional design. <clears throat> Try everything in. It's just the the CAD workup, I get back. Now, I'm, you know, uh, for a long time, I switched over to using Burbank for all these arches and they would send me all these uh, images. Tony's in the back, he actually owns Burbank Dental Lab. Probably one of the smartest guys and that's not a dentist in this room. Um, he has restored more arches than anybody I've ever met. Um, now, we got his, now he has a son, Andrew, in the office. And Andrew does a lot of the, uh, uh, the milling for bigger, advanced, harder cases. He's kind of like an engineer brain for, for reconstructing these cases. So this is the PMA. I add my acrylic on there, finished the case, delivered it, tried it in, custom abutments, gold anodized. I'll show you some more of this anodization. Does everybody have a gold anodizer in their office? 
If you go to if you go to uh, painfulpleasures. Yeah, go to. Yeah, so, so, so titanium freely bonds to oxygen. I'm, maybe you remember that from chemistry. Um, but it will only within a couple, couple of hours, oxygen will bond to it. And then you, you, can, you, can, um, you can gold anodize it to get a better hue and change the oxidation concentration on the outside of the titanium, which gives it this color or hue. And there's, there's a spectrum of colors. So if you, if you just Google, uh, titanium uh, anodization chart. It, you, you, there's greens, blues, pinks, gold. There's there's tons of different colors, and it, it uses a different frequency to anodize these things. Yeah, it, it, it's really really nice. So uh, I just gold anodize these models. Some labs will do this for you. It depends on your lab. I don't know if they're not. If they're not, then just buy the solar machine. It, it just makes the final result of uh, everything look a lot nicer. PMA in place. This is just a before and after of the pre-op implant position. And this is just a pilot guide. And then I place the implants freehand versus a cross-sectional CT of the implants in the actual position. I was blown away at the first case that I ever did with Corey on how accurate the implant positions were. Now, remember the wag factor Corey talked about? You know, I was off a little bit of the apex, but the look at the implants planned versus the actual position. It was unbelievable how accurate this thing was. I was completely blown away at our first case, especially compared to my original case. So this is my original case that I did. The implants were in, this is the, the bone reduction and me doing this freehand. And this is versus what I did all guided surgery. I mean, there's there's no comparison on how much better guided surgery is versus freehand, especially bone reduction when you're flapping a big mandible. And I had more landmarks on this side, but even still, once I removed all the teeth, I lost everything. Right? We wind up publishing this in uh, Dental Town. This was in 2018, so the case must have been in 2017 or 2016. Um, and Howard Ferran wound up reaching out to us and and. Uh, Told us how great a case this was, but it's just a before and after to show um, how accurate the implant position. I mean, even the implant positioning in this X-ray versus this this X-ray, you can tell that this looks incredible, super impressive. So I want to again, like I said, I want to replace these implants with a 4.6 by 7 millimeter implant. I had had a failure here. I wanted to have this late failure here. I want to final restoring uh, on five implants with a candle, two, two point cantilever here. And this is more along those lines of the five years evaluation of keratinized gingiva. I'm, I'm really big on keratinized tissue, gingiva in the, in the arch. I mean, I'll show you article after article that's important. And, um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'm just, just want to tell all you guys how cost effective that surgery was. It cost me $20 for the guide and the provisionals and the custom abutments. My lab bill was not high, right? because everything was planned properly. It was an easy case to restore. This is a company that maybe nobody's ever heard of, but they're about $8,000 in Arch. And I asked one of my friends to borrow this case because he actually presented this at a national meeting. So he had, and he lives in a very wealthy area of um, Virginia, something, something like that. And um, he charges roughly $40,000 in Arch. So. This patient came in, needed upper and lower, and it's eighty thousand dollars for his fee, including prosthetics and everything. He's gonna do the whole thing, um, but he hadn't yet jumped into planning his own cases. And I've been a big advocate of, of, of trying to, to tell him to start getting into planning his own guides and three printing them. He just he keeps telling me, "Danny, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy." And the learning curve is too big for me. He wanted to take a coronary course. Um, earlier this year, and I've, I've, I've spoken to him a couple different times, and he said it's completely changed the way he's practicing and lowered his, um, his expenses to you know, the company that he was previously using. So I think it's $8,000 in Arch. Is that right? Is that, I have that right? It's a little less. So like 7,000 or? 
Okay. So let okay. So he paid. He he wanted everything done. He wanted the he wanted the surgical guides. He wanted the stackable. He wanted the provisionals to be milled out freehand. He didn't want to have to do any planning himself. He gets the case back. <clears throat> this is his patient, upper and lower, full arch, fixed, eighty thousand dollars. Beautiful photos, right? The guide's fully seated. You can see its lateral pins are in. This is the uh, full arch case right here. Pickup, implants. I mean, to me, everything looks like he's doing a, a stellar job at this point. He does his conversion. This is the post-op panorex taken day of. This is his bite day of. Flawless, right? Patient leaves, calls him over the weekend. This was Friday, calls him Saturday. I'm in pain. Calls him Sunday. Pain's gotten worse. And I think my teeth are loose. And and at this point, he's like, you know, there's no way that your teeth are loose. You know, maybe on the upper arch, I need to tighten up the, you know, the, the screws on the implants. Maybe that'll help out a little bit. But just come see me on Monday. Monday morning, this walks in. And he has no backup plan. Guy spent $80,000 and in three days, his upper arch is out of his mouth. So he had to call a lab, ask him to make him a denture that did the conversion and overnight him a denture. Came in two days later, so this patient had gone with, with teeth for three days because Sunday, Sunday night they fell out. He didn't get the teeth in until Wednesday, delivered them on Wednesday. Put him in a denture and now he's gonna have to sit in the denture for six months, go back and do bilateral sinus slips and redo the whole entire case. That $8,000 is partially lost towards a surgical guide. And now he's gonna to have to pay another $5,000 for the new surgical guide for the upper arch. And then the final prosthesis, whatever that costs. All that to say, if he'd have done this in his own office, he could have paid $20 for the upper guide. He could have placed the implants. If he would have had a catastrophic failure like he did, he would have already had the, the wax up in his office. He could have 3D printed a denture that same day and delivered it that same day. Just more control in your office. That's all I'm saying. And Corey has like really dumbed it down to the lowest common denominator for most of us because I'm not as good as Corey at all in, in surgical guide design. There's no way. But I, but you know from taking watching this course and teaching this course with him so many times, every time he he shows up and, and I really do think today is like the best surgical design that he's ever had or presented. And it's, it's super easy. So. If you're gonna immediate load, right? There's always protocols because everybody wants to immediate load, immediate load, immediate load. So the protocols that I follow are on the board, right? And so mandible has to be accessible with cross arch stability. You have to have cross arch stability. Um, the maxilla, the maxillary teeth can't be natural opposing uh, your full arch prosthesis on a Bruxer that's smoked. It's too many negatives against me. I'm gonna have some problems. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you all these PowerPoints so you guys can thumb through them, but you're welcome to take pictures. The circumferential torque value has gotta be greater than 120, and that's that's literature. So each implant has got to be 30 millimeters, 30 newton centimeters above. Or if you if you run by ISQs, 57 to 82. Um, and then Lyndon Cooper, does anybody know Lyndon Cooper? He's a, he's a prosthodontist at UNC. He just recently moved to Michigan, I believe. This is a surgical, uh, Criteria for immediate loading versus not immediate or delayed loading. And I'm a fan of immediate loading because I do it a lot. I'm also, you know, if that's not your comfort zone, don't do it. Um, you can run into more issues with immediate loading versus not immediate loading. And then let's let's get this out of the way because everybody always asks me when I'll, I'll show this full entire case, finish the case, and then, you know, it's all on six or all on four or whatever. And then somebody will say, well, why didn't you distal angle your implant? I do sometimes, I don't think it's efficient every single case to, to change the angle of the implants. If you're gonna gain from this position and not gain a millimeter, I don't understand why you would distal angle the implant. It's only gonna make the surgical, surgical components uh, harder. Like you're gonna be more limited in what, how you can restore the implant because you're gonna have to use a cross or a multi-unit abutment, right? To change the, the, the degree. Um, and it's going to make the surgical guide 
implementation more difficult and the actual placement of the implant more difficult, especially if the patient has a natural dentition or small mouth, right? So I'm good if you want a distal angular implant. Not all of my cases are distal angled implants. If it increases the AP spread, and yes, I agree, you can distal angle your implants. If it doesn't have any value or create any value for me, I'm gonna place the implant straight or even internal sinus lift and place my implants a little bit more distal to increase my AP spread, right? So I'm good if you wanna do that. I just don't do it for every single case because I don't see the value. This is my wife, my daughter, and uh, Corey's wife, who you guys saw earlier. We're, this was in Hawaii. John has 32 candy bars. He eats 18. What does John have? John has cavities. This is a lady who ate candy bars. And no kidding, she lives in Louisiana. Go figure, right? What, uh, the 19? Oh, uh, you know, I never, I never asked him. I never asked him what happened. Um, Cause he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have loaded it if he didn't get the correct torque value, right? Um, my initial thoughts whenever he showed me the case was, I, uh, you know, my, my initial thoughts whenever he delivered the case was, I, I think the guy might've been a, did you see how, let me go back. You see how big and tall he was? I just, I just feel like he could have been a massive nocturnal Bruxoser. Bruxel, right? Right, right. I, I haven't had a failure that catastrophic, you know, back on the wood. And, it, you know, I don't want one. Um, but, you know, I've had a single loss in a full arch, you know, twice. Uh, yeah, and, and like, like a, and this was taken the day of surgery, so maybe he's numb, maybe he's bringing his jaw forward twice a day. They're just trying to get a picture. You know, I don't know all the ins and outs and details of what happened. I, I just know this is something that, you know, six implants failing, that's a complete loss. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Super extreme. Um, so this lady has um, obviously advanced periodontal disease. She is the the... CEO of a local company, go figure. But she works in the back. She doesn't see a lot. She doesn't have a lot of uh, communication with um, customers. She mostly is with employees. And if an employee comes in her office, they sit across and, you know, it was one of the grossest smelling mouths I've ever smelled before. But um, she has not been at the dentist in four years. She's completely embarrassed her mouth. She has three kids. She's married. And this is her dentition. Um, are you going to immediate load on this case? This might not be a good case to immediate load just due to the advanced bone loss and, you know, periodontal disease and infection. Um, this was the workup. Now, this case was done at my office in front of like 20 dentists at that black and white course I was telling you guys about. Corey designed the surgical guides. Um, we're gonna take the teeth out, use a bone guide, put four implants in. It's gonna be a lower fixed versus an upper denture. We couldn't afford it. Um, so Sheldon Lerner at Blue Sky Bio donated the implants and restorative components. And I did the surgery. Um, she paid the CRNA fee for that day for the sedation. And she paid the lab bill for the procedure. And um, this is the, the guide right here. It's gonna be a bone guide. Um, so if, if you're gonna use a pilot drill versus the full arch guide bio tubes or on Blue Sky Bio's website, if you wanna use these metal sleeves for your cases, they have the largest inventory of metal sleeves for every implant system out there and for every desire that you have on what you wanna use. So this is what I use for the 2.0 pilot drill. Um, so. And you can use either one of these. This is the outer diameter of five, or this is the outer diameter of 3.1. So you can use different outer diameter guide sleeve tubes. So the inner diameter, so a pilot drill is 2.0 millimeters in diameter. 
and the offset has to be 0 0.1 millimeters because you can't have a 2.0 hole with a 2.0 drill because they'll get stuck. It has to be offset by 0 0.1 millimeters. So um, these are my surgical drills for a blue sky bio. I have this little setup. Corey was doing this one step drill guide for a while and that's pretty much what I have. This is their new keyless system. Um, I don't know if anybody has this keyless system, but it's incredible. We actually have it here if you want to pass it around. You just make your surgical guide has the 5.15 diameter diameter uh, offset and the keyless is five millimeters in diameter. So it fits perfectly when you print it on Sprint Rate Pro 95. Ray, are we set at the restaurant for a table and all that? Okay, cool. For noon, okay. So I'll, I'll finish this case and we'll go grab my teeth. Um, but after the teeth, all, all the teeth are extracted, cured, all the granulation tissue removed. There's a lot of blooding, a lot of bleeding from the heme. We're gonna make a full thickness dissection flap. This is gonna be the middle nerve on both sides, just reflecting to appreciate it. The surgical guide going in. These are our guide sleeve tubes. This is the one-step drill protocol. Is everybody familiar with this? The, the one drill protocol for implants. <clears throat> uh, implants going in, these are blue sky bios. I think this is a 3.5 by 15, 3.5 by 12. Uh, subcrestal placement, profile in the bone around it. This is a, this is a really cool uh, photo because there's so many, when you start to get into multi-unit abutments, there's so many different little screws and angled versus non-angled versus healing abutments. So I made this little box up of all the components that I have for Blue Sky Bio. These are the impression transfers to the multi-unit abutment titanium copings. These are a lot nicer than these, but they have both, both sizes. I'm, I prefer these because you can actually use it for, for your conversion prosthesis if you want to use these as temporary titanium cylinders and they can be used as for the final impressions. Um, it's important to note all multi-unit abutments are, um, so the, the multi-unit abutment itself gets torqued out at 30 to 35 Newton centimeters, of course. The 3.0 implant, our multi-unit abutment, our conventional abutments are 25 and these tiny multi-unit abutment screws are 20 Newton centimeters, of course, torqued out. You go past that, you could fracture off these mini screws, right? So 30 to 35, these angled ones are 35, this is 20. And this screw goes with all these components. All right, so day of surgery, cover everything up. This was a bleeder. I don't know if you can hear that or not. You can see the bleeding right here. So I just, all I did was, uh, we used to use bone wax in residency. Um, all we do now is just lay PRF on top of it and it's the fastest coagulant I've ever seen. Lay PRF on top of the ridge, suture everything up. And again, you see my suture technique, leaving these PRFs exposed. So I had like eight PRFs, I think, um, around four implants. So I put a PRF over each implant and it, any PRF that's exposed kind of gets burnt burn off, uh, so to speak. So I'm gonna let this heal for a couple weeks. I gave her an upper immediate denture, a lower immediate denture. This is the soft tissue healing. You can see how nice the PRF looks 19 days post-op. And I'm gonna do a conversion now to get her into something fixed because she's miserable with her denture. Her mom called me griping and complaining about her daughter not being able to wear her lower denture. And I thought, those for free. But at, at day 19, I wanna torque these multi abutments out, doing a uh, conversion on the denture, get her into fixed. I always grip blast or sandblast. This is how they come stock. I'll grip blast and sandblast and it holds acrylic a lot better whenever you're doing the pickup uh, chair side. Uh, open tray final impression. You looted, I was looting them together with GC pattern resin, but GC pattern resin has a 5% shrinkage. So I switched to Prima pattern LC resin that shrinkage is 0.5%. So you don't have to section them. Everybody okay with that? Final impression. You can see my PRF, no scarring. See how nice the tissue is? Six millimeters of keratinized tissue at the crest 
on somebody that had that much periodontal disease and soft tissue loss. Final Panorex before and after. Final, this is her bite. Uh, this is how it was delivered to me with the final prosthesis. I was not happy with that. So I wound up adding some uh, acrylic and approximately here, trimming this back on the spatial aspect. When I'm, I, at the lab I was using at the time, this is what I was getting back from them pretty often. So I wound up switching to them because it's too much of a headache um, to add to the intaglio and fix it. I don't have to deal with this anymore. Um, she was extremely happy. She said, thank you. Uh, thank you is enough. You trust, you let me trust you. You have a gift. And she has been one of the best hygiene patients in the practice. She never misses an appointment. She brings a toothbrush with her and a water pick at work. So she has them at her house and at work. And after she eats at lunch during the day, she water picks and brushes those implants have been they're beautiful. We wind up not doing the implants on the on the on the maxilla because she had no bone, just and she's been she's been satisfied with the suction posterior palatal seal. I'll rip through this real quick. Um, yeah, immediate loading maxillary implants, four or six, both approaches may represent a predictable treatment outcome from form of rehabilitation. So if you wanna do all in four, fine. If you wanna do all in six, fine. I don't have a hard set rule. I'm not clear choice. I'm not gonna immediate load every single case on four implants. Um, a, a lot of my patients, my preferred choice is six implants for more stability, stronger long-term prosthesis. Um, and immediate loading, I'm, I'm good with both if you want to. I've done implants on four, I've done implants on six, I prefer six for obvious reasons. This patient was referred for uh, upper and lower fix on implants. This was referred to me for all on four, upper and lower. But you see how much bone volume he has in, in this posterior area? And I felt like I could, I could get an implant back here, um, if I just bone graft the sinuses on both sides, I just wouldn't happen at this angulation at 30 degrees on both sides. Plus this infection in site number uh, 10 was so aggressive, it really kind of destroyed the bone around this area and this area and compromised both implant positions. So the idea was just to scrap the upper arch, graft the site, maybe even do some sinus bumps so I can put an implant a little bit more posterior back here and, and prevent this distal angulation and get a better AP spread on the top and bottom. We'll start with the top, eventually go to the bottom and then you know, place five implants. He really, he had like three or four millimeters of bone in the posterior, uh, his right side. So I couldn't put an implant on that side. This is upper failing dentition. Look at the, look at the uh, wear and tear of the anterior. And I'm never really, really, really focused on this as much as I am right now. But obviously this is an aggressive amount of, of, of wear. This is the perianal involved tooth number 10. You can see the, the, the inflammation around the gum tissue. Um, this is the day of extraction, bilateral sinus lifts on both sides and grafting. And you can see I went from no bone to, you know, a, a big amount of bone on both sides. I use, uh, huh? Uh, I use, I've tried Ogma before. I don't, I don't love it. Um, I use fusion, which is calcium sulfate, beta hemohydrate, uh, mix in a Luralox with syringe with genomycin. And then you add that to your uh, mineralized freeze dry bone allograft. And then it creates a putty and it has a setting time. So once you put it in the maxilla, it, it's almost like firm. And when you put it in maxilla, it sets like a cement type thing, kind of like, you know. Um, but I always add PRF first around my Schneider membrane, and then I'll, I'll add bone through my, my bone syringe, pack it medi medially first, then apically, then distally, then medial wall, and then all the way back to the lateral wall. And then put a pericardiac membrane on the exterior on both sides. Day of surgery, it's after uh, 12 weeks of healing. This is pre-op, full thickness flap, this is surgical guide. I'm gonna place my implants in the maxillary arch. This is just uh, after he's healed. The sinus on both sides. Surgical guide, Ooh, not close enough.
Ten plants went in. Speed up a little bit. Uh, hair difference between fix. The inherent difference between fixed removal processes or treatments are critical for clinicians to understand. They're often clearly the key points for clinicians to explain the, the features of, of fixed removal. Um, it basically, this article talks about the prosthetic design and the implant placement, the key positions um, could and do vary from fixed to removable, right? Um, it's more so important if you're gonna get a first molar occlusion that you have your implants a little bit more distal, if you're gonna have fixed as opposed to, you know, removable prosthesis, you're keeping the anterior for locator over dentral. Okay. But then maxillary prosthesis treatments may consider different, especially whenever you're, you're going softer and opposed to maxilla. So this is my initial placement, these four implants. Lower arch, um, bone reduction guide, implants going in, bone graft around these implants. This is my new surgical drill. I'll show you where I get this. You can buy it from Henry Shine, this, this straight hand piece. It's about 17 or $1,800. Um, I found that on eBay for about a hundred bucks. And it, it, it just broke this week after seven years. So I'm gonna buy another $100 uh, straight hand piece. These are some bone contouring. This is my favorite bone, bone contouring burr. It looks like an acrylic burr, but it's got uh, serrated, a little bit more aggressive uh, treads on the burr itself. And you can see how well it, it removes cortical bone and how fast and easy it is. eBay. You can buy it at Henry Shine, I think it's like $900, or you can buy it at eBay, I think it's like 50, 50 bucks on eBay. The hand piece is $100, the burr is 50 bucks. I have another PowerPoint presentation showing which ones that I bought. I, I, I have like 25 of these things. This is the best one I've, I've found. And surprisingly, I got it off of eBay. So lance drill, pilot drill, implants going in, all torqued out. The, 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 you're going to have access to all these videos. So you can go back and watch them if you want to in your own time. Well, so, so if it's a, if it's a uh, guide, the secondary guides can be placed on the bone. It's got to be really, really accurate. And you have to have lateral pins to stabilize the bone reduction guide. Um, if you're doing lateral pins and the new offset guides that we have, you can reduce the bone, but it doesn't have to be that perfect for the new drill protocol. And plus it, it gives you, it's better for irrigation purposes. Um, do you have So this is the digital conversion I, I did at the time. Doing digital conversions. You can do this uh, with, you can 3D print a guide on top of the denture. Corey has a video on that. You know, if you planned your implant positions and everything came out perfect, you can 3D print a guide to take your denture and go in the lab and pre-drill this out and hollow it out. So then whenever you go to the mouth, all you have to do is just lay it on top of the implants and it'll go through the temporary type film cylinders and you pick them up and pull it out. Does that make sense? <laughs> Um, this is the final soft tissue. This is the final prosthesis. This is his final bite. This is a before and after smile. I didn't, I didn't restore this case. I just helped restore the dentist. This is a Burbank case, upper and lower. Does anybody have a problem with this case? <clears throat> Oh, um, 
I no longer do this. I, I did this for a couple years where I would do fixed on the lower and upper implant supported overdenture with individual implants, non-splinted. I've had absolute nightmares. I no longer do this. If it's if they want lower fixed and don't mind removal up top because they want to try to save some money, that's usually what it boils down to. Because everybody wants fixed, then I I absolutely get an implant bar made and the locator attachments are inside the bar instead of individual implants. So what I've had is, especially on Bruxers or people with sleep apnea, they'll overstress the implants and I'll lose implants. So this is um, a normal person will. Uh, clench and grind, and they can put five pounds of pressure per square inch. I didn't understand this until I had this person. Uh, okay, remember catastrophic failures we just talked about a second ago? This is my catastrophic failure. Because this guy bruxed to, an, to, to 500 pounds per square inch, 10 times what a normal person did at night. He's so nice. Such a nice guy. I never thought he was stressed out with his demeanor, but he would go home and he has some, he has some mental issues he's developed later on in life. And um, so, so to prevent that, you have to increase the AP spread, which I didn't have in this case. Use larger implants and add additional implants. Remember I had four implants in the upper? So I broke all these rules in this patient. And the applied forces of mastication for swallowing, I mean, it was just a bad treatment plan for this guy and it, it wound up losing all the implants. And this is just article after article about uh, implants in patients with bruxism. So we know they brux, but we don't know why they brux. We don't know how to prevent them from bruxing, right? So I'll show you what happened and Corey alluded to this, but occlusal overloading is an issue in implants and you can lose integration in implants, especially in the maxilla. So this is like one year in service, I started to have these, this implant, some bone dieback around my implants. I eventually lost all the implants in the upper arch. And so what I did was I removed them all and I, went, I decided to go to fix for free. So I went to place in more implants in and immediately converted them. And then those implants failed. And then I took, them out, took out the prosthesis, took out the failed implant and I went up having to take out those implants and place in more implants. And I was scratching my head to figure out what happened. And I didn't realize it until I was in the final restorative phase after those implants have healed. So now I have one, two, three, four, five implants that have healed and I have four locators in place. And I had this thing in my hand and I thought when I 3D printed the bar, I thought I, I, I shrunk the 3D print when I printed it out. And I thought there's no way that his maxilla is that narrow. And I put it in his mouth. I got him an upper implant supported arch. And then I went upper, upper bar implant supported overdenture. He's been fine like that for, since 2019, so the past two years, no, no problems. And I went back to his original CT scan and I measured his inner canine width and I measured it and he didn't have molar. So I couldn't measure the molar, molar uh, inner molar width. But the inner canine width for a cleft patient is 26. And a normal individual is 36, 10 millimeters greater for inner canine. Now, intermolar is different. Intermolar is 40 for a cleft patient and 44 are above. So this guy's inner canine was 27.9. So about the same level as, as a, as a uh, cleft palate patient. Um, his PVA angle, so it's... Um, the angle at which his, you know, nasion and portions and the, at the degree of taper of his uh, mandible was abnormal as compared to the normal individual with an oh, with an open airway. Is that okay? And then if you look, just if you look at the, it, it, even if you don't understand all that and you, and you don't get it, if you just look at a cross section of patient's mandible compared to their maxilla, look at the deviation from this buckle to this buckle, and obviously there's something wrong. Right, obviously his, his mandible grew to the correct proportion, but his maxilla did not. And, and so I'm restoring this guy that was originally constricted with a, a full arch palate, constricting him even more. And then he's bruxing because he can't breathe at night. And all he does is, is destroy the implant. So now I have an upper thick implant splitted cross arch with the implant supported over denture and we're good now. Okay, um, we'll stop there because it's 12 o'clock. We'll get a bite to eat.
do a possum. What about a recording? Pause recording.
Quick. Go to the old Facebook. Oh, he's placing a ton of them. He, he does basically an arch a day, and he's just kind of wound up running. Now this is kind of one prototype. So you've got a you got a tube here. It's still resting on the ridge, and it just has a little face that sits against the zygoma. Well, I'm I'm lying here. It's supposed to look like metal because you can get them printed in metal, but they're pricey, so I spray painted it gray. It's just printed surgical guy. Honestly, I don't think you need the metal though. The the printed is just perfect. But since you know exactly where they're going to end up, you can pre-plan prosthetic holes for your pickup and everything. It's, it's really pretty simple. I got the pictures here. So that's it from one side. Yep. The other way is you know you've got a packing model and say, well, I'm going to build in a packing model here so that they have it all around and then pick it up. And it sounds ghetto, but actually, I go back to like a verification theory. You've got this big thing and you've only got maybe half a million of that. And once the cement builds that, how these packs are picking up things to do. So it can be difficult to see them exactly right and all that. So I would, I would much rather do the, the photograph. I don't have the scans with this one. I know it's more expensive. I don't think it's going to be. We've got that. Yeah, like uh, we only use one of my uh, cohorts or the same thing. He's like, he did 200 arches at the county that he was the director of, and they did a study on it. And hands down, it's the only time that this thing can be And you can't have models or anything. He can tell you a lot about that. He doesn't know a lot more about it. I've not had to play with it as much, but you know, you just see play it. And then I will get lots of time to play with it. What I find is sometimes these stand on. Thank you. 
So I would do it all at the, the initial diagram. Not much sleep last night, so all right, we'll go ahead and get started here. So let me make sure that we are recording. We are. All right, so I'm gonna get on the just a small soapbox about kit. Someone in here You've realized that's not bad enough. Listen, I don't care where you spent this place in it. I just spent this place in there, no well impact, and you love spending money with my people here as well. Um, that doesn't mean you have to use their kit, right? A hole is a hole. The body doesn't know who's drill made it, and it doesn't know whose titanium you're screwing into it. All we're trying to do is make accurate holes, okay? So this is uh, the Blue Sky Fully Guided Kit. A couple things ought to jump out at you. One, it's a lot smaller than most guided kits, which translates to a lot less expensive. Basically, when we built this kit, we had kind of, uh, myself and Armin Rezaia and a few other people that had used a lot of these other systems, we kind of put together a drive list. And here's all the things we want to uh, fix. But here's some things about some systems that are great, like the cam log drills, those were, that we tried to mimic. So basically what we came up with is a keyless kit and there's no key built or, or there's no external key that you have to fixate in and then drill through. That, those have a couple of problems. One, someone else is going to have to hold it down because you're holding the guide, you're holding the drill and all that. So you need a lot of hands to use them. They add tons of height. So if you're doing a first molar implant and you're probably using a fixed length 20 millimeter drill, and you've got to get it up and over the tube so that it can drop down. It's just impossible. So you, what you end up doing is preloading it outside of the mouth and then carrying that in. But good luck on a bone supported case. That's just not going to fly. <clears throat> so keyless drills are going to allow you to have a lot less required opening space. Because if I'm only placing a 10 millimeter implant, then I'm only going to have basically a 10 millimeter drill. So this is kind of what the drills would look like. Uh, this would be looks like a eight millimeter uh, drill for a three five by eight biomax. But basically every single drill from this little transition zone up, every drill, every carrier, everything is the exact same from that point up. 
And what you'll find if you measure it is you'll have this six millimeter straight cylinder part, and that's really what's being guided. Okay, so there's never anything that cuts that comes in contact with the plastic tube. So that's a big deal, believe it or not, because that means I don't have to buy tubes. And okay, listen, tubes are not but $7 a piece, but think if you're doing an all on six case and you've got six tubes there and then maybe five lateral pin tubes, and then you need the pin tubes on your prosthetic and your reduction guide, like we're adding up big time now. So we don't have to use any kind of uh, metal guide sleeve in these. You just simply set the software where the hole diameter, uh, this thing, if you measure it, is about five millimeters in diameter. So I make it, if I'm using this kit, 5.15 on the hole size. That'll be a real good tight fit, but with virtually no deviation. And that might vary 0.5, uh, up or down based on your printer, but you can just try multiple of them and see which one gives you the best fit. And then from that point on, you know to always use that. <clears throat> the offset for these drills, if you're gonna do it without the metal sleeve, it'll always be eight millimeters. I'm sorry, 8.5. So the kit's designed with this always being 8.5 millimeters from here where the business end of the drill starts up to the stop. So that's two and a half millimeters of transition and then six millimeters. Every drill is that way. And that makes it really nice because tubes are always in one position. And then if you're placing an eight millimeter implant, I grab the eight millimeter long drills and that's what I'm using. So it's really simple, a lot less parts. Uh, the drivers have the exact same built-in key on them and you could drive your implant <clears throat> in. There's a lot of systems that would be similar to what I showed earlier, which is a guided osteotomy but then you kind of freehand it in, and then you lose a lot of your control over exact depth of placement. Trajectory can get off sometimes, sometimes it'll bore its own path. So you actually want to use a guided driver that is going to make you put that implant into the exact position where you had planned it. So this has got a guided driver, and there's really only one nuance to this entire kit. Um, and I'll say this a few times, if, if you go into the software, the software, they want you to buy a sleeve, right? I mean, that's just solid business. Why would they not want you to? So they set this at a default offset of eight because the tube they recommend you use is a half millimeter high. So I would suggest you forget about tubes, just change it to 8.5 if you're using this kit. And again, you can use this kit to make holes for anyone's implants. Body doesn't know, okay? We're just trying to make accurate holes. So just change it to 8.5 offset. Your hole diameter should be 5.15 and that's it. And that's all your tube settings. That's all you need to know. The only nuance with using a keyless kit, whether ours or someone else's, that you have to realize is that that offset distance is fixed. That eight and a half, every drill in the kit was designed to work with an eight and a half offset. Now, if for some reason, let's say you're placing a really deep implant, uh, an immediate or something, if this tube at that standard offset is digging into the bone, I don't worry about tissue because tissue, I'm going to flat back. But if it's digging into bone, I've obviously got to raise that tube up, right? So this is the only nuance. For a keyless system, if you raise the tube one millimeter, then you've effectively shortened all your drills by one millimeter. Make sense? Because that was the position that it needed to be at. So now your 10 millimeter drill is only getting down to nine. So as long as you know that, you can account for it. Again, if I'm placing an eight millimeter implant and I had to raise the tube two millimeters to get it up out of the bone, what final length drill do I need to now go to? The 10 to compensate for me moving that tube up two millimeters. So that's really the only nuance to this. And you do have a variable carrier because if, the, if you do raise it, the standard carrier right here is not gonna work. And so this is the alternate carrier that if you have to raise it, you can do it at the standard eight and a half, 10 and a half or 12 and a half. So I, I kind of only move the tube in two millimeter increments to so line up with this. And that's kind of how the drills look. Um, again, far shorter because the business end is only gonna be as long as the implant you're placing. So if this was for a 10 millimeter implant, I've only got 10 millimeters plus 8.5 and that's it. So they're much, much easier to get good access in the mouth and they're just a lot fewer parts, which means it's gonna be a lot more affordable uh, case. 
Now, I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time just showing, just doing cases, right? We'll just start with one, it'll be bone segmented, and we'll just build the whole thing. But one thing to kind of get across to you is what will be your problem if you, let's say you do an all on four type planning and you disto angulate. How do you control which direction your multi ends up? So think about this, you're gonna pre-plan your holes right here. And I've got to perfectly rotate that implant into place so that when I put in that 17 or 30 degree multi, it emerges through here and not through here. So how do I control that? Well, I've got to get the timing of the implant the exact same. When I say timing, all I'm talking about is the degree of rotation. So if I can rotate a flat, for example, to the exact same place in the mouth as where it was in the software, then everything should line up and you'll be good. So this is not a full arch case, but it's a one tooth implant case, but it demonstrates this well. Uh, this was a buddy of mine, Aaron Carmine. He had never placed an implant and he found this lady. No, 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 I'm sorry. This was our buddy. This was our friend, Jetty, that really bugged us that he had this missing tooth up front. So we were helping him out. But the kicker was he was gonna move to Hawaii like a week or two after we placed this. So it's like, well, he's not coming back. He can't afford it for support down there. So we decided to roll the dice. We were gonna do immediate implant with immediate load and an indirect sinus lift for his first implant. So not exactly where I would recommend you start, but uh, that's what we were gonna do. So same principles, just now down on a smaller scale, start from the end point. So we designed the ideal crown, emergence, occlusion, all that. Now we're gonna plan our implant backwards from it. And so we positioned the implant where it needed to be. So always try to shoot for two millimeters of bone on all sides. You might could squeak that down to 1.5, but if you've got less than that, you really need to be adding some graft because you're gonna lose some bone and those over time will end up, you know, kind of not looking the greatest on an X-ray. Or a little bit into the sinus, we, we don't need to do a lift or anything. Usually if I've got that, I'm just gonna use those safe ended sinus spurs to reach it and then just plug either collagen or PRF in there. That'll elevate it just enough that it'll tint itself down on the apex of the implant. Now, the step for, uh, further we were going here is we wanted to make his final crown before we even did the surgery. So think about the accuracy you've got to have in this whole system if you're going to deliver the final crown and you've not even placed the implant yet. So in Blue Sky, you can actually put on the different abutments. So we grabbed a tie base and we positioned it. And then Blue Sky Plan now has this crown and bridge module. So you can actually go and turn your wax up crown into a screw retained crown that's gonna fit on that tie base. Okay, now the kicker is this is a hexed tie base. So do you see my dilemma? It, if I just bond these two together and it's, it's uh, uh, non, what I call that, uh, not engaging, then I can just rotate it in where it needs to be. But I use text. I've got to have him turn that implant to the exact same position in the software into the mouth. Same will apply when you're doing any kind of an angle multi-unit, which is why I'm showing you this. So we made the guide and I've got to just figure out a way to orient the guide so I know turn it to here and you're in the right spot. So the way I do that is I just turn the, the bone and everything off and zoom way in looking at the implant because the virtual implants are hexed as well, or you know, 12 notches, whatever, if it's an Astro. But I'm looking and here is the flat. So all I need to do is just create a notch on the guide tube right there. And then there's notches on the driver that align to each of the flats. So when he's cranking in, we'll get to the bottom and then he's just got to turn it enough that there's one of those notches to align a flat to this line. So you can emboss that in using the software, you can do it in mesh mixer, but this is just his timing mark. And again, any full arch case with an angled multi, if I don't wanna to have to sit there and play with it and try it on, nope, I need to go five degrees more, try it on. Like that's a big pain in the butt. You'll do the same thing for any of those. So I actually tried this out on a set of models because the first time I tried it, I wasn't for sure it would work. We made a, a final crown out of that printed resin, the, the new stuff that's, FDA approved for final crowns. I was a little worried because all I had was A2 
And that's what he was getting, but he didn't seem picky, so he just rolled the dice. Made a little flap, used the guided drills, and then these are the guided sinus lift drills. I've got this guided sinus lift kit up here if you want it. Nice thing about that is if you're gonna use the Blue Sky fully guided keyless kit, the sinus drills are all on the same tube settings. It makes it really easy to use. And man, it's as dummy proof as you can make a sinus lift. So again, his first time ever placing an implant, he got it to depth. And then all I'm doing is making sure that notch is lined up here. And if it is, I know the implant is positioned exactly as it was in the software. And if that crown was made for that position in the software, then it should fit right on. And so this was a pre-designed final crown that we delivered right after placing the implant. Like it was already bonded and everything. And all we had to do was run a little sandpaper through one contact and it was great. But I was, I was, this got me thinking like, why do we not do this instead of healing abutments? Because no healing abutment I've ever seen is shaped like a tube. They're all cylindrical so that they can rotate in. Why are we not just, I mean, the way I did in my practice is we would bury our implants, but I would take an intraoral scan before I buried it. So I could actually design while they were healing a final crown, we printed or milled or whatever. And a lot of times I was just going straight to the final zirconia crown. And then at second stage delivery, I'm going to split the keratinized gingiva like Danny's been showing, push it out to the side so I gain some and deliver my final crown. And now you're healing to the actual contours of that ideal crown, not to this garbage can shaped healing button. So that, that would save you a mountain of time because you're talking two appointments from placement to the final. The gingiva is going to heal to that much better because it's, again, one implant or what's the concept? One abutment, one time. You know, if we're always taking stuff in and out, we're breaking that gingival attachment. This gets screwed in one time, you never touch it again. The tissue forms to it, to that ideal shape, instead of forming it to this arbitrary round shape and then trying to reshape it and make it anatomic. It's, we just do that all backwards, I think. And there's no need to now that we can do it digital. So that was kind of what he ended up with. And the gingiva here is going to end up shaping itself. It'll fill the papillaries because I know from my plan where five millimeters from the peak bone is. So as long as my contact's not farther than that, I'll always have 100% papilla fill in. So this is really a nice way to do these. And thankfully, he ended up being A2. So I'm pretty pumped about that. And there's his final. All right, so let's, let's talk guides now. So that's kind of the... The one thing I wanted to get across to you when you've got to align angled multis, because that, that can make life difficult. So let's just go through a case example here, and then we'll do a similar one in the software so you can just see the nuts and bolts of it. But the pictures we're always gonna get, we're gonna get a full face, smiling, a big E smile, so that you can really see their teeth. A lot of these patients are not used to smiling anymore, so you're gonna have to really work to get it out of them. Then I wanna lip at rest with lips apart because I'm just trying to see where the incisal position is relative to the uh, lip. And then we want to get a lateral view. So this is, oh, and one more, the retractive view. This is really useful to get as well. And I try to get that full face retracted. I want to actually see their retracted teeth and their pupils and their face and all that stuff. So let's pick it apart. What, what needs to happen here? It needs more incisal length. So I'm looking right here. And if I wanted to kind of follow that lower lip, I'm probably gonna add two, three millimeters onto this. This one's way short. Midline, he's kind of shifting a little bit this direction. So I wanna make sure that my midline follows uh, with this number eight being no farther mesial than where his current one is, but with a longer incisal edge. Uh, buckle corridor, what's what's going on there? You like it? I don't like it. Look at this caved in area back here. So he needs more length in the buckle posterior. And obviously the teeth need to be widened out quite a bit. This side, not as bad, but it's just all ragged. Nothing is following a smooth line. So here's again where it comes in really nice to be doing those simulations. As if we're trying to get them to buy into treatment, I promise you this takes two minutes to do and you can give to them, you can email it to their spouse or whatever. And it, it looks real, like it looks like their real face just with better teeth. 
And so this was done in just a couple of minutes. Um, there's another free program you can use called GIMP. It's not as intuitive, but it's free. You're cheap like me. Uh, so you can do that. Dentron, which Danny has, um, DTS Pro, Photoshop Elements, all of those are good options. And then based on this picture, I know exactly what I need to do. Because even though I can't do it right here, I can turn the transparency of this simulation down where I can see his real teeth below it and be like, oh, well, to achieve this, I need to add three millimeters, whatever the case may be. And now we're going to align all the data in Blue Sky Plan. So we take the cone beam, we've got intraoral scans, and notice that he was scanned at the intended vertical. So usually for a dentate person, I would not be doing them in occlusion because usually we're talking single tooth implant, but this being full arch, I want him in that, that full maximum intercuspation at the intended vertical. Because again, that's gonna make my life a lot easier when I'm trying to design occlusion. And we did measure him and he did line up with the correct vertical. So I don't need to change his vertical any, he's all good there. I just really need to put the teeth in a better position at his current vertical. So the models get stitched in, and now you can start doing that digital wax up. So I've usually got it in a, in a different window, that simulation turned to about 50% transparency. And then I start doing my digital wax up in the denture module and just placing the teeth. I just drag a tooth over here, put it down to where I want it. Drag the next one. You can kind of do them as a chain and I'll show that when I design a prosthesis here in a bit. But this is kind of what we came up with for the wax up. So he was a little bit bucked out on those anterior, so we tucked them back just a tiny bit. But this is basically gonna be a better occlusal plane. He's got a little slight curve of speed. Uh, the teeth are longer. They're, they're just positioned where they should be for this guy's face now, okay? So current smile, simulated smile, you send them this, whoever speaks first loses. Once they're down with treatment, now you just do the wax up like I just showed, referencing these pictures. And that's just showing that transparency. It's a little grainy and difficult to see, but you can see his real tooth right here versus this simulated one and how much has to be added to achieve that. So now we can actually plan implants. So we've got uh, the models of his bone. I've, I'm just assuming, you probably know I've done bone segmentation. More than anything, that's the thing I see people let stop them from doing these cases is they say bone segmentation is just too, too difficult, well, quit doing it. Just pay 50 bucks and let someone else do it. Uh, it takes them 12 hours to do in India from uh, image 3D conversion. And now you've got them and you can just start making guides. Like you don't have to mess with any of that. So you'd rather save the time and not mess with it than go for it. But I've got a segmented jawbone because I need an STL model of the bone to build a guide onto. So these are the implant positions that we came up with. And we have to think about the restorative space, right? So how do I know that I need to place them that deep? Well, again, it comes back to here. So once I've determined where the ideal teeth were and notice that his proposed new lower teeth are actually lower than his current ones because I need to get rid of some of that deep bite. So I just measure 15 millimeters backwards from that because he was going for a hybrid. And that tells me that's my minimum amount of space that I need to make a hybrid, okay? And unlike a lot of places, you know, they just, they don't wanna end up with too little. So they just mow down a huge arbitrary amount of bone. Man, I just, that just killed me to see it. The bone is so hard to regain once it's gone. So I measured from incisal edge of the proposed tooth, not, not the original, but the proposed teeth. And I'm going 15 millimeters back from that. Um, actually, I don't have it quite up there. It would be 17 if I had it up to incisal edge. But that's how I'm determining how deep my implants are. So based on this, do I need bone reduction? Yes, it is not gonna be a reliable, accurate drill if I try to go all the way from the top with my tube way up here, all the way to the uh, apex of this implant. It's just not gonna be accurate. So I'm automatically thinking, okay, 11 millimeters needs to go. That's for sure a bone reduction guide. So that's what we're gonna do is reduce the bone here. And uh, you know, if it's one to three millimeters, you don't need a reduction guide at all. If it's three to five, then you can consider just placing them deep 
maybe they're four millimeters subcrestal, and then you just grind the bone down where they're maybe one to two subcrestal. Because I still like them always to be subcrestal at the end of this. But deeper than five, and you gotta have a bone reduction guide or you're really gonna create problems. All right, so here's the workflow. First of all, we gotta accurately position the tubes, or I'm sorry, the pin tubes because everything depends on these pins for positioning. If I'm not in the right position where, with my pin holes, really none of the rest of it matters. So what's gonna be the most stable reference to drill off of? Would it be soft tissue? Would it be off the bone? Would it be off the teeth? Like you made a guide, how, which one would give you the most confidence that you're receiving this fully to depth? The teeth, because you can see it so easily, right? You can make a window in that and see, oh man, the inside of the edge is completely seated in this. So if they've got teeth and they're not just completely wobbly, use those for your pin guide. And this is just a throwaway guide. It, its only purpose is just for drilling those pinholes and then you toss it, it's done. And again, it costs you a dollar to print, so who cares? All right, that's, that's just showing the bone segmentation step. So you can actually build this just on their, their regular old STL. Right? This doesn't need to stretch all the way up to where you're going to do your bone reduction. You just need it to stretch high enough to capture those teeth. All right, we've done bone segmentation now. I like to, to go ahead and virtually extract the teeth because I know when I go into the surgery that the teeth are going to be gone when I seat this next guy. Does that make sense? You're going to put it on the teeth, drill your pinholes, and now just take it out and extract all the teeth. Okay. So since I'm planning to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and just use the cut tool and just cut those teeth off real quick, okay? It doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just, you want the bulk of that tooth out of the way. And that gives me somewhat of an edentulous model like you see here. All right, now this is, uh, this is the one that throws people, is you've gotta create a path of draw because think about a max, the topography of a maxilla. If you just build this straight to the bone where it engages undercuts, it ain't going in. So you can generate a path of draw model that is just gonna block out those undercuts so that you won't seat into them. Now, I need to change the slide because I said hack the denture module. This is now just right there within the surgical guide module. You can create a path of draw model. So this is actually what I'm gonna build my guides on so that I know they've got a path of draw and they'll go to place each time. All right, now we're gonna build what I would call the pre-reduction guide. I call it that because it's what will become the reduction guide. And all I'm doing is drawing directly on the maxilla. This is my guideline. I just wanna go apical enough that my pin tubes will be incorporated into it. Any beyond that is just excess flapping that's not really providing a benefit to you. But I do wanna turn on all of these pins because those are gonna be critical to index this into place. And I haven't changed them. They're the exact same position as that initial tooth supported guide. So I build this, that gives me something like here. Obviously not something we would use, right? We've got to actually do the, the bone reduction. So this is your pre-reduction guide. Save it and export it in case you ever screwed something up and need to come back to it. Now, how much do we reduce? So. The easiest way, in my opinion, is just to turn the transparency of your models. Again, I'll do this when I demonstrate it on the software here in a few, but I'm gonna just turn the transparency of both models down 50%. And you wanna be looking at it from the lingual because the cut tool is not, it's not a very smart tool. It will cut indefinitely through anything that's behind it. So imagine like if I cut right here and I'm just wanting to cut the anterior, well, I'm cutting everything posterior to that too. So look at it from the lingual, just like you see in this bottom left or bottom right picture. And now you use the cut tool to make those bone reduction cuts, okay? And I'm gonna make the cut such that it still leaves the implant one to two millimeters subcrestal. That's just how I like to place a conical connection implant. So I use the cut tool and I just come in here. Usually I'll do like the front two and then I'll spin it to the side, make another cut kind of in the same line we'll make this reduction cut so that we know now we've got the adequate restorative space. And this is what would be left after doing that. Now this one I've got doing lingual coverage. I rarely do any lingual coverage now. If anything, I'll make a slight occlusal extension that just helps aid in seeding it. 
but most of the time they're just purely on the buckle. So it's a lot less flap reflection. It's a lot easier to get to. So that's our bone reduction guide. And now the nice thing about this workflow is we don't have to make more guides from this point on. All we're doing is modifying that current guide. So I'd export that reduction guide, it's done. Now I can go and make this floating tube design I've been talking about by just exporting the guide tubes from Blue Sky Plan. All of that stuff is exportable. You can export your implants, your abutments, all of that. So I just export the tubes and I'm gonna take it into Mesh Mixer and just join these two together into one STL. Again, I was talking to someone at break about, you know, could you do all this in Blue Sky? There are ways. There's definitely some faster ways in Mesh Mixer. So you don't have to learn all of Mesh Mixer, but you kind of do need to learn a few little tools within it. And one of the great tools it's got is this add tube function. And when I hit add tube, it'll just pull a, an STL tube up and have a red dot on each end and I can drag each end to where I want to connect. So I'm doing that here. And basically what I do is I, I run a tube from the, uh, the side of it to the guide, buckle and lingual if I have a lingual section, and then I'll run a tube between each uh, tube themselves. So you end up with this really rigid cage like guide. And I'm just gonna repeat that on all of these uh, adjacent implants. And this is kind of what the drill guide would now look like, okay? The fit is not dependent on you perfectly reducing the bone. You've got better irrigation access and it's faster to make because we're not starting over and making a whole new guide that we then have to modify. All right, so we've got a pin guide, a reduction guide and a drill guide. Everybody with me there? At least in the big picture. So all we lack really is the, the uh, immediate load prosthetic, okay? So to make that, again, I want to create two and a half, three millimeters of restorative space. So what I do is I've got this STL, of the jaw now of what shape it's going to be after I do that reduction. I just highlight the crest of that ridge and there's an offset feature within Mesh Mixer and just tell it to offset it by three millimeters. Okay, and when it, when it does that, you get this surface. So if I was to build my denture now on this surface, then the intaglio sits two and a half, three millimeters off the ridge. Make sense? So all I've done is just saved that shape and pulled it back into Blue Sky Plan. And now I'm in the denture module. I'd already done the wax up, right? Because we figured out where the teeth were. So that part was done. I'm not having to set teeth or anything else. That's already taken care of. All I'm doing is turning it into a denture now. So I'll skip the steps of that. I'll show it when we actually do it. But basically this is the shape that emerged. It's uh, the software thinks it's making a denture, but it has no flanges, right? It's just gonna be three millimeters off the ridge. So I've got this shape, but how do you index it? Because if you try to freehand it, you'll, you may go too deep and sink it too much and have angry tissue, get some bone dieback. If you don't go far enough, their EDOs open, they're gonna be uncomfortable. So what's the best way that we could index this into that consistent position? Yeah, you've already got, again, your drill guide or uh, your reduction guide, just import that. And once again, use that add tube feature. So again, I, I never worry, will the next guide see? Because they're all the same. There's nothing about this hybrid sitting up here that affects the fit of that guide at all. So if you see it right once, you can definitely see it right a second time and a third. So that's how I do that. And how would we get these pickup holes? What could you use in Blue Sky Plan to create those? Yeah, so on Blue Sky Plan, you can put on an abutment to any implant. So if I wanted a six millimeter pickup hole, I could just put a custom abutment on that is six millimeters in diameter and heck, 20 millimeters long. Because all I'm trying to do is get it to where it's protruding out of this. And then one of the functions I'll teach you in Mesh Mixer or Blue Sky Plan, both will do it, is uh, it's called a Boolean difference or a Boolean subtraction. It just means I'm subtracting these tubes from this object. And when I do that, it leaves me behind these pickup holes. And in theory, if your surgery goes right, then when you seat this, your pickup cylinder should be right in the middle of that hole. 
and all you're doing is squirting some acrylic to connect the two. And once that acrylic's set, I don't need that indexing portion anymore. So as soon as that acrylic is set, I snip here, snip here, snip here, and all of this uh, bone reduction portion that's indexing it can fall away. We remove it from the mouth and all you've got to do is basically salt and pepper any little voids you see on the intaglio. But we don't have to reshape it. It's already shaped to where it's cleansable, either flat or ovate in nature. So it, it really is a great workflow. I would also recommend always printing these models of the jaws because those are going to be a byproduct of your design stuff. You're going to have a model of their jaw what it was like before you did reduction. You're gonna have a model of their reduced jaw. It just costs a dollar or two to print them. So print those and that gives you the opportunity to play with the fit of the guides. If it feels too tight, or maybe you want a little broader range of path of draw, you can just grind that in. And that way it's not, you're not seeding this thing for the first time on the jaw in a big bloody field. You know, you, you know that it's gonna seed on there reliably. So I would suggest doing these models. Anytime we send cases out, we always uh, provide those models as well. Both the, the non-reduced uh, jaw, which you see here, and the reduced jaw so that you can try in your, your drill guide and everything as well. And if you want a backup denture, this would be the time to make it as well, because you never know when the cases are not gonna have enough primary stability and you might need to you know, put them in a temporary denture and just bury your implants. Once again, it's the exact same process, only now you're building the denture in the denture module on their original model. I've just virtually cut off the teeth and I'm just building a denture on their gingiva. So this would be everything that is the final stuff. We would print all this. Um, you can see it takes about an hour, hour and a half to print the teeth with that shape. And again, this is not something you're gonna be able to mill. It'd be very difficult. Printing the models, you, know, you can see the volumes that are required. And these are, this is a different case, but exact same protocols. You know, you see the pin guide. Uh, well, actually I didn't picture the pin guide. This is the reduction guide after we've used the pin guide and extracted its teeth. The reduction guide goes into place and you know it's in the right place because the pins go in. So we're reducing down to that flat surface. And then once we've done that, pull it, seat this one. And again, notice this one's buckle only, there's no, these things are floating occlusally, but they're not touching the ridge anywhere. So we seat this, the pins go back in and stabilize it where you can drill. And now you place your implants and they should be right in the center of the hole. So now you put on your temp cylinders and I did a little different method here. I didn't index it on the, the reduction guide, but you can also create some little feet that just sit on the reduced bone and that holds the vertical. There's a lot of ways you can skin these cats, but look at how accurately the cylinders fall within this. They're just dead in the middle of it. So all I've got to do is rinse this and get it clean and then squirt some acrylic in between each cylinder and let that set up and then unscrew it, take it out of the mouth, salt and pepper the underside and you're done. There's no grinding flanges or any of that stuff that you would have conventional denture uh, conversion. I won't steal Danny's thunder on, on how he generates 45 millimeters of keratinized gingiva, but bottom line, we, we do this, what's called the full arch healing abutment protocol, meaning just like when I was talking about the single tooth crown, it, it seems dumb to me that we put in an arbitrary shaped healing abutment, form the gingiva to that. It would be a lot better if we just formed it to what the tooth shape should be. The same happens on full arch. Whatever that tissue heals to is what it's going to take the shape of. So we need that temporary to be ovate or flat so that it's cleansable. And you don't have to remove these periodically to, to do hygiene. And we also can always use more keratinized gingiva. So basically what Danny does is draw about seven gallons of their blood preoperatively and spin it into 45 PRF plugs. I've never seen someone who can stuff more PRF in a person's face. It's unreal. I mean, he'll put 27 layers in. But at a minimum, try to put in two per implant. And that's going to fill that space where the, the space I left between the, uh, the bottom of that immediate load denture uh, conversion prosthetic. And then we're not trying to get primary closure with the sutures. He's just going to basically do two sutures, one on each side, maybe first premolar area, just snugging them to the restoration, not to one another. He's snugging them to the restoration. So imagine this, you've got piles of PRF. They're pinned down by the uh, immediate load prosthetic 
that is keeping that in place. And then keratinized gingival on each side, just being pulled to the, the restoration. And if it's keratinized gingival on each side, what's the whole thing in the middle gonna fill in with? Keratinized gingival. So a bunch of different examples. And he's got, he'll show more of them, but this is an example, it doesn't look pretty. I mean, it, it really does not look like a beautiful suture like you wanna show in a, in a magazine, but that's not what we're going for. We're going for real world results. So he's gonna let this all granulate in and they don't generally have tons of pain because they're covered by that PRF. You'll generally slough off the top layer and the bottom layer really turns to something. And so this is just an example following that protocol. Went from this really narrow band to now this. And by the way, why is that angry and red? Yeah, that's an example of where I, I left it a little too long. So it's in a bit too close of proximity to the bone. So he had to open up that a little bit when he restored it. All right, so this is a uh, this is a case that me and Danny did last week. I, you may have seen this on social media, but I just thought I'd pull it up because it's in my recent files. But I've kind of deleted everything. We're just going to start from segmented jaws. Do y'all want me to show segmentation and teach it, or would you rather? I, I mean, it's going to be on videos. I'm happy to do it if y'all want to see it. it. Doesn't matter to me. Or are you going to farm it out? Then it's a waste of time. All right, show of hands, show bone segmentation, one jaw. All right, I'll, I'll do a quick one. I'll do the mandible because those are always quicker and easier. While that's loading, let me pull up her pictures and we'll kind of go through. Uh, your three, Tony, Trey. All right, so this was, uh, again, Danny does great about always getting these pictures. So what's the problem here? What's not a problem here, honestly? Yeah, so this, she's pretty dramatic, the difference between having her dentures in and not. You know, this, the only thing this would help me with is if I did the papillometer ruler, because I could just see where her lip is hanging, that tells me a ton about where to put her incisal edge. I'd probably give her two millimeters of show, and it'd be dead on nine times out of 10. So obviously without the denture, she's super collapsed. That ain't gonna fly. That's the same girl, just with her dentures in. It's crazy. But let's, let's critique this. So this is kind of, you know, again, starting from a pretty good denture. I would not start over making a new denture with this. It's got some flaws, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So any issues you're seeing, one way that'll really help to make them stand out if there are is just, again, this little PowerPoint template, a vertical line, two horizontals. And both of these are parallel. So I know what inner pupil area is. So is, is she good as far as canting? Do we need to change anything there? She may be a little long in the canine areas. So I, I like where her incisal position is. It looks like it's right on that wet dry line when she's smiling. Um, what about this? I'm looking at that and thinking she needs to not have a flange because that really stands out. So over dentures are out for me right off the bat, unless she wants to continue having this tumor under her lip, whatever that is. Midline, we good? All right, so when we do this wax up, we're gonna basically exactly match her current centrals. And all we're gonna do is on the posterior, I don't feel like we really need to widen her either. Okay, she looks like she's filling that buccal corridor pretty good. So all I'm gonna do is from the lateral back, 
just tip them up a little bit where they're not kind of giving that reverse smile line. That's the only change I've got to make. So we open up the software and Danny did a dual scan since she had good dentures and we pull those in and now I can see where the outline is of where the teeth should be. All right, there's the dentures in place. And now I got to determine how much restorative space I need. So first of all, facial aesthetics. There's some people that you look at and they're too caved in and you think, man, they've got to have a flange. So now I'm automatically thinking over denture. So that comes with certain requirements for space. They have very little bone loss because they were newly edentulated. I might think FP1, I can get away with 10 to 12 because I'm just replacing crowns. But I better be dead on with my implant positions. Um, so the plan for her was a hybrid. Uh, just with her budget and everything, that's what she could do. So I'm measuring from the occlusal of that backwards, 15 to 17 millimeters, okay? And that puts the implant down here. So are we thinking bone reduction guide or soft tissue supported guide, potentially? Yeah, that's probably, well, maybe I'll show it later on. That's probably 10 millimeters of bone reduction. So don't just drill from the crest with a tube up here. It will not be accurate. All right, so then I need to place the rest of the implants. And here's where you kind of, you might tweak a little bit. This implant may be 18, this one may be 15, because we want to really kind of get them on a, on a uniform plane. Otherwise, your occlusal plane is looking like a roller coaster. So I try to get them relatively evened out. And these are the positions that we came up with. Uh, notice my anterior positions, I'm a little bit lingual of that incisal edge because it's going to be a hybrid and that's not going to be a problem whatsoever. I would be very worried if it was leaning way out and my screw access hole was going to be right on the incisal edge. But if it was a FP1, now I'm going to use custom abutments. I want it right under the tube. So it, it changes where I position my implants based on which type of restoration I'm doing. So we place the other implants. A, a good quick and easy way to do this is like if you place this implant first and you've already put on that you know, five, six millimeter abutment, then rather than go through that with each one, just right click and say duplicate. And now you got a second one, you drag it over. Right click, duplicate, drag it over. And it's just a really quick way to get in there. All right, so this is the measurements, nine millimeters to the platform. That's a bone reduction guide all day. So if I need bone reduction, I'm kind of stuck now with segmenting the jaw. So the jaw has got to be segmented and I'll do hers for you so you can see it. Uh, I kind of have some little cheater methods that I use and videos you can reference on how I do that. But again, don't let this stop you from doing these cases because you can absolutely farm this out for 50 bucks. It might be money well spent if this takes you forever. I've just done a billion of them. So it just doesn't take me long. So the implants are positioned. Now I need lateral pins. Pins need to be in between the implants. And when you're positioning them, they need to be penetrating down maybe two millimeters below the implant platforms. Because otherwise they're gonna be above your plane of cut and, and it's gonna, you're gonna be trying to reduce your pins when you do that. So place them a bit apically from the implant platform. And mandible, I'm usually doing four to five. You're better off to do more than less especially if they're a dentate case, because how many times have you had a pin that was supposed to be somewhere and then in removing that tooth, maybe you lose the whole buckle plate and now that pin's worthless. So heir to having too many, you don't have to use them all, but that way if you lose one or two because of trauma from surgery, you, you've got something to work with. All right, so we'll look at these in all the different planes. You definitely have to make sure you're not going farther than the lingual cortex, because a lot of big stuff with big names uh, in the floor of the mouth that you don't want to drill wrapping up in. So uh, this is just showing the, the settings that I'm using, because most of the planning I do is for that Blue Sky uh, uh, fully guided keyless kit. So I'm going to make the whole 5.15, the height is 4, and the offset's 8.5. And when you change those, it's going to say, hey, your default, or you're going away from the default settings. Just say, okay, I got this, it's not a problem. As long as you know why you're doing it, it's just still assuming you're gonna use a tube and now it's saying, well, your, your drill isn't gonna get deep enough. So don't worry about that warning when it comes up. So this is the first guide I make. 
So a couple things to notice about it. I'm just building it straight on to that path of draw mandible so that this thing has a good path of draw all the way up and down. My contours are way overextended and that's by design. You want to, on the initial one, make them way overextended because you can cut back as much as you want. But what used to happen to me too often is I would try to you know, make it the exact contour I want. And then by the time I do the reduction, I've got a piece that's half a millimeter thick and it's just gonna break while you're trying to use it. So go big with your, your contour for drawing that guide. And now you're gonna use the cut function. So we're gonna cut behind here. And I usually do the front two and then I'll rotate it. And I'll look at it from this view and now I'll make another cut. And I'm just going a couple of millimeters coronal to the implant. And then I'll look at it from the other direction. And then we've got this. Now, this is a new kind of thing I did. She doesn't have the ability with teeth to set an initial pin guide. So really her reduction guide is the first thing going in. And if it's buckle only, you can get off a little bit on your up and down. So all I did was I just cut a little portion of the original pre-reduction guide and I left that in because it just makes an occlusal stop right at the midline. Rest into the ridge, and then when he starts reducing, he can just buzz right through this, blow it out of the way, it's, it's gone. So this is the level I'm gonna do reduction to. That just purely aids in fully seating it to drill the pinholes. Pin it into place, second. Yeah, there's no lingual on this, so. Yep, that's all you'll need. Yeah, I think that one I passed around, that's how it was designed, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so I've already got a reduction guide generated. Now all I do is add the tubes in, and we're just gonna start adding the little extensions to connect this. That's just that same add tube function. And if you wanna get fancy, this is absolutely not required for any of you doing your own cases. Yeah. Yeah, these. And notice too, how much cut back the contours are from where I started. Like, I don't know if I show it from the lateral, but you know, I got to cut it up and above the mental frame and you can see a little bit of it right there. Okay, but I left it long from the start and then it's easy to cut away. I mean, it takes seconds to do that. So I can make this a really thin profile with no excess flapping necessary. Most of these end up a lot less traumatic flapping than your typical all on X guides that you would get from most places. And part of that is because it's buckle only. The other part of it is that we're determining everything up front and then cutting it back to the least it can be. So I'm adding the tubes, there's the final guide. And this is what I was saying, you, do, you don't need to make these. I would just print probably the reduced jaw and the original jaw, just hollow them so they don't take tons of resin. Um, but since we send it out as a product, I usually go ahead and cre create this fancy jaw with the reduction section that kind of comes in and out uh, just so they can try everything in. And it's kind of like doing the real surgery. Pinholes are there, all of it. Upper was the exact same workflow. I created a couple little occlusal extensions that as soon as he pins it into place, cut those off, they're, they're no good anymore. Now we're just doing reduction and then we swap, we swap it out with the drill guide and then that's the end of it. And he, I forgot the reason, we didn't need the immediate load because you were just doing next day delivery, right? So what we usually do is make an immediate load restoration with the preformed holes. He just said, on this case, don't worry about it because I'm gonna do an eye metric scan at the time of surgery remount it digitally, and then I'm just gonna mill temps that I deliver the next day. So we didn't do it there, but uh, I'll show you on this other case how I would do that. What's it called? There it is, Billy. What the heck? 
Okay. Yeah, screw it. You show it when you get up. <laughs> I can't get it to work right now. I think I have a file named that same thing and it's reading that or something. All right, so let's let's just get in the software and do a case. And I'm just gonna take this from A to Z. And once I'm done with that, it'll probably be time to switch over to Danny. He'll do the, the last couple hours. So this is that same patient, all right? Um, I said I'd do bone segmentation. So I'll show that real quick. Now, I've kind of got a cheater method here. Imagine that none of these files are here, all right? I've just opened up this STL. Um, you could bring in the dentures. Again, that part is pretty self-explanatory, but we know from the PowerPoint and just measuring and stuff that we're gonna need bone reduction. So I need a segmented jaw. Now you can do that purely through this uh, bone segmentation. Get this over. It's gonna be in your model editing module and it's right here under segmentation. So you can do advanced jaw segmentation and just outline whatever area it is that you're wanting to segment. The problem with doing that is that it takes forever. I mean, forever. And we can cheat and kind of get a really nice result without doing that much. So here's the way I'll cheat on this. When I first open this up, within your surfaces panel, you've got some buttons down here at the bottom. So if I'm clicked on the CT, again, imagine these are not even here. I could hit isolate and just click on the mandible. And it's gonna say, okay, everything that's not mandible or touching mandible is just gonna disappear. So now I've got this, all right? Now I've also got the ability here to say, create model. So all that this is doing is it's just turning this into an STL, all right? You're probably thinking, yeah, that does not look like $50 worth of, of work, but there's a reason we can't just use that, okay? So let's make this a different color so you can see it. All right, this is the model it produced. And if I turn on what's called the hint, which is the outlines of this, you can see now what this jaw looks like. Now, what do you think would be the problem with building a guide into this model? That's a good example spot right there. If we just built a guide on this model, what, what's the issue that's gonna have? Yeah, so you've got an STL, you tell the software, build a guide to it. Well, it's just gonna build the guide straight down until the first STL surface it encounters, which means that it's gonna to try to build way down into here. You know, maybe you can't see it well there, where's that hole, or here. We've got holes, we've got porosity, because again, all this was doing is saying everything of a relative density of say 800 and higher, we're gonna turn to bone, everything that's not isn't. But this is bone, right? It's just the software doesn't know it. So the problem with just doing this, and it's way worse in the maxilla, which is less dense bone, is that you're, you're gonna just have too much porosity. On the other hand, it's really good at picking up thick cortical plates. It's really good at picking up things that would be hard to segment like sinus walls, nasal septas, all that kind of stuff. So the idea is I wanna keep this cause it's got some useful information. And it looks like on the buccal and lingual, it's dead on accurate. There's nothing that's a problem on this. It's really only this occlusal part that is problematic from my standpoint. So that's good news for me cause it tells me I don't need to segment the whole stinking jaw. I could maybe just do this occlusal five millimeters, okay? And the reason that's great is because the bigger area you outline here, the longer it's gonna take and the more slices you have to do. And it's gonna make you do a minimum number of slices, but you're probably gonna have to do more than that. So I'm gonna do that. Not the whole jaw, I'm just gonna do the problem area that it missed. So we've got these tools within the segmentation like the intelligent lasso. And if I hold the shift button and circle an area, then just like the software did, it'll say, okay, everything of such and such density here, it's at 600, we're gonna turn pink and everything that's not that density, we're gonna you know, not show, all right? If I was to look here, you know, there's areas that it missed and this is where kind of the human element comes in. Maybe I need to lower this to where it will grab anything to a density of 500, 
right? Now it's grabbing a little more, but it's still not perfect. So I might actually have to take a brush and close in some of these areas. And then once I've closed it in, then I could hit fill holes. And now we've told the software, hey, in this slice, in this position, all of this is bone. You need to include this, not just do it based on density. So that's one. And it looks like I'm going to have to do a minimum here of nine. We'll do additional slices. It's just a wizard that you're going to workflow or uh, work through. And this is where it's hardest is up here right on the crest because it's always squirrely, not very dense bone. And if you think about this, are you better to err towards going a little over contour? Like right there, I can't tell exactly how far that bone goes. Am I better off to just do it to say here or to maybe go too much and say out to here? You're better off to go too much because ultimately if let's say we make this jawbone and it's got an area that technically isn't there, it won't affect your guide seating at all. There's just gonna be a little isolated area where it's sitting up off the ridge. But if you go the other direction and you don't include something that might be bone, now your guide has a high spot. It's not going to sit down because it missed a part of that bone. So if you're going to err, err towards incl including more than you think you need. Like right there, you know, all of that, I would probably go ahead and buzz in. There's nothing in that one to do. And now it's going to take you through another half of the slices in cross section. And once again, we can fill holes. Now, why did it not fill in all that? Do So I pushed fill holes and it missed that. This is not a continuous boundary. So one thing that has really helped me to realize is it, it takes you through a bare minimum. That doesn't mean it's the ideal ones. So if I was to go back to this axial, I would love to create a line that's continuous right there. So every time I hit fill holes, it did the whole thing. So I could just jump back here to the axial and go to the very bottom slice of where this starts to pick up, boom, right there. And now let's just add an extra slice there. Yeah, it's taking a little more time, but the benefits are that it's gonna speed you up on everything else. All right, now let's try this. Intelligent lasso, there we go, fill holes. And you see how now it fills in that whole area? Fill holes. Got a little spot there that I need to close in. Again, this looks like I, I would be better off to over contour this a little bit than to under contour it. So we're at eight slices. Using the brush to close it, fill it. And now that's really all we've done. Now you can do the bare minimum. And it'll always ask you, hey, you only did a few. Do you, is that all you wanna do? One in my experience that would be beneficial to add is to like get around the, uh, oh, I'm gonna try to say the uh, mental framing area right there and then jump over to this implant tangential. Because if it's gonna miss stuff, it typically misses right on that crest. That's where it would be beneficial to add more data. So I can add additional slices from any view that I want. And now I can, tell the software, okay, that is bone, that is bone, that. And then up into here. And then let's just do one last one over towards this side. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of looking lengthwise down the ridge. And that adds a lot of data for the software on the very most occlusal aspect of the ridge so that hopefully it's going to give us a better proposal. Hmm. I know I've been doing this how many years I'm still finding stuff.
And if you want to get fancier beyond that, like this would usually be the case in say a, a, a maxilla where there's a lot of difficulty. Remember, you made this model first. So if I was to look through in say some of these views, it looks like it's capturing everything great, except for in some places. Well, if I can scroll to those some places where it's pretending to miss it and add that data, that just makes the whole thing better. So I just scrolled through to this one spot where it's clearly got a hole. That would be a good place to add some more data to this. And then really close that in. And now you've, you've told the software exactly in the place where you needed that additional information that you know, we need to include that. You could go in a sagittal view. Right, this is like through the head this way. And once again, if I see an area where it looks like it's going to have lots of holes like that, you know, if it's giving me trouble, maybe I'm going to add some of that. Brush that in and then fill it. So I'm not going to go crazy with this because mandibles are usually pretty easy. You're, you're not going to have a lot of trouble out of those. And I generally, even though I've got dozens of these cases to do a week, I'll still end up doing most of the segmentation of, of the uh, mandible myself. But if I'm in a hurry, I will absolutely farm this out to India. And they do a great job with it. And for a little more, they'll even segment out the individual teeth so that you've got a jaw model like after extractions have been done with real sockets. And then you've got the teeth as a separate file. So this usually takes about a minute or so, depending on your computer. If, if at this point when you're working, your fan kicks on and it sounds like your computer's about to take off, you need a better video card and some more RAM. It takes a big computer to run this program. But while that's doing that, any, any questions about just bone segmentation in general, as soon as that's finished, I'll show you how I combine those into one really, really good model. All good there? It's only needed when you're doing a guide that will sit on bone. So sometimes you might have a guide that they've done the reduction for you and it's just gonna sit straight on the bone. But if it's gonna sit on bone of any type, then I need the bone segmented to build a guide onto. All right, so once this is done, I can push create surface. So now look at what we've got. We've got this new model. Remember, I didn't go very far with it. I just did the top area. And we can now look at it. So if I was to scroll through here, again, right there, that's an area there was a hole when I just did it with the density, but my segmentation picked it up. And maybe we can find an area where my segmentation didn't pick up, but that model did. Okay, look at this. There's some kind of random bone spicule here. My segmentation didn't do as good a job of picking that up, but the other one did. So again, you could do this 100% within segmentation, but you'll have to do a lot more slices than what I did, and it can get pretty tedious. So if you're willing to venture into mesh mixer, then that's where you can save some time on this. I'll try my best not to overwhelm you with mesh mixer because there's a lot, but it, it really is a great program. I think it's worth learning. So I've got this model. I really just want to create a model that's the best of both of these. So the way I can do that is go to export data. So when you're using the export, anything within the case, if I have nerves, I can export them. If I have implants, abutments, and tubes, I can export them. But whatever you have visible in this 3D window, when you go to this, is what's going to be checked on automatically. So notice I don't have the nerves visible. I could turn them on, but it's not going to default them on. So since I turned everything off except for those two jaw models, then that's all that's checked and I'm going to export them. If I export them together, there are two STLs right now, but it's going to export them in, into one file, which is kind of what I'm wanting to do here. So let's just go into downloads and I'm going to say Billy Mandible. All right, so mesh mixer. I just saved that as an STL, so I'm going to import it. It was in my downloads and it's called Billy Mandible. All right, here's what we've got. And it's kind of nice that, you know, the density surfaces picked up all this 
anatomy of the ramus and stuff that I wasn't going to bother segmenting. It, it makes for a nicer model. But the problem is it's still two independent models. Like if I was to click on the one, you see there it is. And then if I was to click on the other, here it is. They're what would be called two different face groups. Okay, I don't want that. So all I'm gonna do is go to edit, make solid. Because remember, we've got two STL shells right now. This is gonna combine them into one. The problem with it is it's going to default to doing this in a really fast manner. And when it does that, you lose a lot of detail. So I can simply change this to accurate instead of fast. I can take this solid accuracy all the way up to the maximum and maybe a little higher mesh density and then update it. I don't push accept yet. I'm going to make sure it does this in a more accurate manner. So it'll take a, you know, another few seconds to figure this out, but it'll be a much more accurate rendering. All right, so there it is. This time I'm gonna accept it. And now let's look at the difference in this. Remember how the first one had all that porosity and stuff up in the front? This one, if I was to say, you know, plain cut through here, that's all solid up inside. Now it's not solid everywhere because there are little areas that I didn't bother to segment, you know, like where it connected inside of here. You want to get fancy and make it where the whole thing is, is solid. There's ways I can do that. For example, I've just got to get rid of these little connection holes between the inside and the outside. Just delete that. And anywhere that I see one of those little holes, I could just delete over it. I don't care if this is perfectly accurate down on the bottom. If you've wandered down here in your guided surgery, things have not gone well. Okay, a couple, maybe that's one, I don't know. I'll get rid of it nonetheless. Control Z is a good friend to know whether you're doing mesh mixer or blue sky plan because it will just undo whatever stupid mistake you just made take you back to the prior step. See, I was a little too overzealous there. I don't want to get rid of that. You know, I might cut this whole back area off if I wanted to, delete it. What I'm hoping now happens, and it's not yet, and I bet you it's because of the mental framing, but what I'm trying to do is really separate all of that inside mesh from all of this outside mesh. And if I can separate those, then they're gonna be different shells and I can just real quickly push uh, separate and it'll get rid of all those. So now if I click out here, Mesh Mixer has a lot of these hot keys that'll, allow you to do all the functions really, really quickly. So for example, I could click here and then go over to uh, modify and expand uh, to connected and it would do that. But if you look here, there's also hotkey that says expand to connected is E. So for example, if I just click on one mesh there and push E, it all happens. Now I'm wanting to delete all that junk on the inside. I could go up here to edit, flip, or whatever, or I can just hit I on my keyboard, which inverts it and then delete it all, okay? 
Now, if I just run the inspector, we close those holes and now we've got a 100% solid jaw. I know that's a little in the weeds. Just, that's why there's YouTube videos. You're gonna have to practice these a few times to, to get it down. And again, don't get frustrated, just send it out if you do. Let's play, replace her mandible. And I just wanna pull it back in and let you look at it and see how good we did. All right, so remember this is where we started from two independent models. Let's now bring that STL in. It's in our downloads. Now, do I need to stitch this? This is another kind of important feature. Because it prompts me, it's wanting me to stitch here. It's wanting you to say mandible or maxilla and try to align teeth and stuff. And that's great if you're trying to bring in, say, a tooth model or something. But first of all, this is not that. This is a jawbone. And remember, I had it in the right orientation here. I exported it. I modified it a little bit. I didn't change its positioning in space because an STL saves its position in space and its shape and contour. So as long as I didn't mess with that, I can just skip this and it should be in the right position. Like if I was to turn this on now, you should see there's the original mandible. Let's see how our segmentation did. I like to check them out in this axial view and all I'm looking for is missed areas of bone. Get rid of all that segmentation stuff now. Look like we got it. Looks good to me. The other added feature is if I know for sure I'm doing bone reduction, I may not really need to be very picky on the whole crest. If it's all getting whacked, I mean, What's it matter? So that's bone segmentation. Lots of videos for it if you want to torture yourself. Anytime I'm doing a bone supported guide of any kind. So again, you could just send this out, take 12 hours and folks in India do it and you just get back to this, which is two beautifully segmented jaws and you skip all that, right? I don't care what you do, it's totally up to you. Now we can start planning implant positions, right? So remember, we started from her having these dentures that were pretty darn good, agreed? Like there's not really any need to reinvent the wheel here. So first of all, I'm gonna create a wax up. I'm gonna go into the denture module. All right, let's just do, let's just do her lower arch right now. So if I wanted to pull in a bunch of teeth and set them really, really quickly, I could go in here, choose whatever library you want to do, select what teeth you want to do. Let's do first molar to first molar. I'm just control selecting all of those. And then I just got to shift and left click to drop them in and then I'll rotate them into place. Okay. So I'm not guessing here at where the occlusal plane belongs. It belongs right where it is in her dentures because we took the time to have some good ones made. So this setup should be a minute, a minute and a half, something like that. It's really, really fast. All right. Pull this up where the incisal edges are pretty close. All right, those are matched up well. Heights are matched up well. What's off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if they're too far buckle. So that's really easy to change. I can say show or hide the teeth chain. And I like where those incisors are. I'm gonna leave them be. So I can lock them at the, inside, or the lateral incisors. And now if I just hold shift, I can pull this whole thing like a barn door over to where it aligns more to that ideal denture. Oops. I can do individual teeth. You know, if I was to lock the tooth on either side of this, I could pull just the canine back. Lock that more, maybe hinge off the canine. Or you can just manually manipulate them. So if I just turned on manipulate model, I can just drag teeth over where they're a little better aligned. All of those work. I'm not gonna spend much time doing this. We're just gonna 
pull these over just slightly so that we can just proceed. But I would take a little more time in setting these ideally. That's good enough. So I just finished her wax up. And that's really all that you would have to do for that. There's where the new teeth belong. And now I've done everything I need to do in the denture module. The only purpose in me doing that, and I may not have really had to do that. Uh, I could have just referenced her dentures, but since I'm gonna make an immediate load prosthetic later on, I, I want those in there. That's the only reason I did it. All right, so we're doing a hybrid. We're gonna pick a, a Biomax implant. This is a, a smart doctor who does not like to spend $400 on an implant. So he decided he was placing a Biomax uh, 4.3 by, let's say 11. It's in the mandible. I like to put these custom abutments on. Because remember later on, I'm gonna subtract them to create my screw access holes. Oops, not 50, but five. And then just start dr dropping them into place. I'm kind of assuming y'all, if you're in this, have already figured out how to map the nerve. It's already done here. I, I didn't want to waste time showing that. So what I need to do is get this thing where it's far enough away from that mental that that warning goes away. You can always turn your transparency up on the model if you're trying to look at it. And that can definitely go back more. Yeah. Uh, and when you've got nine millimeters of uh, bone reduction, you're going to get that. Now you can turn that warning off. The reason it's warning me right now is it's saying your guide tube is way too deep. So if I just turn that warning off, hopefully that goes away. Distance violation. Oh, it's because I've already got implants in this case. So let me just pretend on this one. How much restorative space we need for a hybrid? 15-ish, okay. So I'm gonna take my measuring tool, go from the occlusal down 15, and that's about the shallowest that that implant can go. So I need to pull it down to right there. Restorative, if I'm doing a hybrid, do you prefer screw access holes in the buckle of the teeth or in the lingual or the occlusal? What's your preference? I would prefer either direct through the occlusal or just lingual to the tooth. So let's, let's just go right here through this lingual cusp. Look at it from all different dimensions. It's not too close to the nerve, we're good there. And then once I have that, then I would just come in, right click, duplicate, drag it over. Right click, duplicate. Drag it over. And the nice thing about duplicating it is that they'll all be perfectly parallel. Now that doesn't mean that you can leave them there. Like if I look at this one, yeah, it's parallel, but it's too lingual. So I'll, I'll end up tilting a little bit off, but at least in the, this direction, they're not gonna be tilted towards each other. I'm just doing this a little bit. So I'll tilt that forward a little bit because I don't wanna have to build a lingual denture tumor to capture that screw. I've done too many of those with my locator over dentures, uh, let's see, it. same thing with this other one I put in, duplicating just gets them in there really quickly and then you can modify it. So I'm gonna tilt that one forward as well. What would be the problem with this position? Like right, let's say there, just from a practical surgery standpoint. Yeah, I mean, Listen, if you've got an implant that's down its whole length, half in cortical bone, half in cancellous, it's not following that. Like it's going to deviate on you and kind of overpower you. So kind of think through that when you're positioning these. I like to slide them right down a cortex. It's usually the lingual cortex here because it's going to be really easy to make that osteotomy. It's more vascular blood. It's everything about it's going to be a better position. So what? Lingual artery. So if you're wanting stuff to keep you up at night, this is one of the few things that concerns me. That guy right there. Everyone see this? So that's down at the genial tubercles. And there's like very few cases in history of people dying 
implant placement. The few that I've seen, a lot of them uh, resulted from this, which is they ended up nicking that. And it's not a huge, like, let me get it in a different view. Let's come over here to the cross section. All right, see the genial right there? So I wouldn't worry a whole lot about, you know, positioning it uh, where I've got it because it's well within the body of the mandible. The problem comes if you clip that thing pretty close to where it's entering. So arteries are muscular. When muscles are severed, they contract. And that thing is a pumper. And so if, if that thing retracts back into the floor of the mouth, now it's in a closed, confined space and it's pumping. And it can start filling the whole floor of the mouth up with blood. And, and they're not going to die from bleeding out. What would they die from, potentially? Yeah. So if it asphyxiates them and closes their airway up, I mean, that's that's a direct result of your surgery. So, and I I, to, I was to the point, I didn't generally like to place a midline implant just because that one scared me so much. Uh, if you ever see that tongue rising, get their tongue with a dead gum hemostat and pull it as far out as you can and call EMS or you, if you're qualified to get an airway, as long as you get an airway, they're going to be fine. They'll recover. You know, you, you've not harmed them for life, but man, if you let them asphyxiate, that's a problem. Yeah, but yeah, what for those of you on Zoom, what Danny was saying is that this happened to his uncle. I mean, gosh, there's few people in the world who placed more implants than him, but he had this happen. And the local anesthetic, it didn't really have much effect during the surgery, but then she got home, anesthetic, uh, I'm sorry, the epinephrine wore off and she started bleeding more and her tongue started swelling and he got her to the hospital very quickly and it was fine. But anyone else ever had that? That's definitely a code brown moment. You know, oral surgeon? Okay. Any oral surgeons in here? Just curious. Okay. Uh, generally, they'll take your oral surgery card if you start doing much guided. Yeah. Virtually every scan you take, if you go to that genial tubercle, you'll see that thing. And unless they're really resorbed, a lot of times your implant won't be that deep and it's not a huge concern. But I still, when I can, I'll try to avoid that, that midline area because, man, it's, it's scary to me. I hate to think about in the old days just how many of these were done and you're just freehanding and all the textbooks show you have one in the midline. So I don't think it's easy to happen, but it can happen is the point. And if we can avoid it, we probably like to do that. All right, so I've got implants positioned. I'm gonna just delete these three that I just did because I've already got implants positioned. We don't need to waste time doing that. All right, so here was the implant positions. Again, why are they that deep? Well, because if we're doing a hybrid, that's how deep they had to be. So now this is where we've got to place the implants and uh, Danny did four between the foramina and then one distal on each side, uh, the shorties. We tend to do a lot of that configuration that seems to work well. Remember the one thing you're gonna to have to change in the software is you're gonna to have to go, and if you've chosen the fully guided surgical kit, again, it assumes you're using a metal sleeve and we're not using a metal sleeve here. So I've got to manually go in and change that to like 5.15. Yeah, I know I'm deviating. I like the height to be four. No, my offset is 8.5. So it's going to warn you with all those, but as long as you know why you're doing it, that's not a problem. All right, so we've got this jaw now ready to make a guide. When you make a guide, if you don't have a tube turned on, that tube will not be part of the guide. Okay, so what are the only tubes that we need turned on at this stage? 
because we're going to make that pre-reduction guide again. Yeah, the, the pin tubes is all I need right now. Because remember, we're just going to end up cutting the whole occlusal away. So that's not serving much purpose if we use those now. So I'm going to just go in and turn on these pin tubes. And again, we went with quite a few of them. Oh, that's maxillary. Don't want those on. So these are the only tubes that I would do. And now I'm going to go to the guide panel. It's a mandibular guide. This is what I'm building it on. Lock everything. This is an important thing. And, and if you're using the very most new update, time is a hair different, but it'll still be the same option. You can create a, a insertion path model. Okay. So just think about from a surgical standpoint, how would you want to insert a guide on a big flat mandible? Like what direction are you going in? Straight down from the top, a little bit from the front and down. I mean, what? <clears throat> yeah, so probably from maybe kind of from that direction. So I can actually say, okay, define my insertion direction from this view and then create an undercut model. And that's what it's doing right now. So if we build the guide on this, it's gonna know that if, as long as you're inserting it from this direction, there can't be an undercut that's gonna block you out from this. No, it's, it's building a model that you're gonna build the guide on that removes those undercuts. So watch, so you know how I can't see the lingual from here? If it engaged on the lingual, like it's, it's gonna be undercut. So you see that? I repositioned it and now you see that's the insertion path. So any place that is undercut from there, it blocks it out, but no more than it has to, just at a bare minimum. So this would actually be what I build my guide on. So now draw curve. Again, I'm not at all trying to worry about where the contours of my guide end right now. I'm gonna make it way oversized. I might even make a giant lingual portion. And I'm pretty sure this one was buckle only, wasn't it, Danny? Doesn't matter because I can always cut that away later. So insanely over contoured here. Now I'll create the guide. Uh, quick word, sometimes if you are doing these buckle only ones, the default thickness Danny was talking about earlier is three millimeters. If you want, you can bump that up. So if I'm doing it where it's buckle only, I'll bump that up to four millimeters thick because it just gives some more rigidity since it's not got that cross arch lingual portion. That's the only thing I've done here. So we'll create this guide now. It's the most painful part to me of doing any kind of live demos, waiting on the computer to catch up. Any questions while it's doing that? You can, any of the above, so like 3D image conversion, they do some, the whole design, but usually what I've used them for is just for doing bone segmentation. And then I do the guide design because I, at least personally, I find that part relatively easy. Uh, I mean, we've got our Transcend Dental Lab does this. We're for pin guide, bone reduction, drill guide, and uh, immediate load prosthetic, we're at about 3000 or so. Um, and you know it's a lot more affordable than what some of the other options are out there. Uh, you can go throw any of those. Uh, you know we're such that we can print it for you. If you got your own printer, we can design it, and we just deduct off whatever the fabrication charge is. So you can really delegate out whatever steps of this you don't want to do online. Yeah, that's what I was talking to Ryan about at, at the break because he's like, you know, I'd like to venture into this, but maybe have some hand holding. So it might be good to delegate the planning to someone initially, 
that way you could still do it on your end, but compare it. And, but then you can print it on your end. I mean, if you've got the resins, then that's going to be fine. Do you have a question? Who does what? Uh, I believe Blue Sky does. So the ones we have are, it's a 2.2 millimeter pin and it just has one designated drill that goes with it. So you just take that drill and hub it out on these pinholes, pull it out and the pin goes in. Well, so good question. It's all I use. Like if I go up here to add implant, I can tab over to pin. The only one that's listed in the software is the Blue Sky one. But if you have Billy Bob Implant Company and they've got some pin that is different, like you can say custom pin and then just put in the parameters, measure it with the caliper and you can use it that way. So you can do anything you want, but as far as pins, the only ones that are defaulted in the software is the Blue Sky. Yes. Yeah. So it'll incorporate those tubes just like you're seeing here. All right. I have gotten to where I don't use pins or, or tubes on the two, uh, lateral pins. Technically, that drill is side cutting. So maybe you should. We've done how many cases without them? And I never have seen a problem with you. And we just drill straight into the resin hole. And that drill's just so small, it, it can't deviate much. It can't generate a lot of shavings. I've quit using the metal tubes on the pins almost entirely. Unless someone insists on them, I'm, I'm not doing them. Yeah, so your pin hole, that's a good point. Once again, pins in the software, it assumes you're gonna use a metal sleeve. If you intend to not use a metal sleeve, the pin is 2-2 diameter, so I make the hole 2-3, that's it because otherwise the position is good on it. So here we go. This is, uh, I would at this point label this pre-reduction guide. And if I was really doing this, I would save the case at this point. The number one thing I see is people don't save it. Maybe their computer's not up to snuff and it locks up or something and they've worked for three hours without saving it. I mean, you want to talk about cursing your life. So this is our pre-reduction guide. Now I can start making the bone reduction cuts. Now, in order to see through that, and I don't need the path of draw mandible anymore, I could come up here and do this original mandible. So I've already got the transparency at 50% on that. I need to tell it to make this pre-reduction guide transparent. And what I would do is duplicate it so that you've got a second one, turn the pre-reduction guide off and call this one the reduction guide, because this is the one you're actually gonna cut on. All right, so I referenced this earlier, but it might not have made sense. When you use this cut tool, like let's say if I wanted to cut uh, right here and I only wanted to cut on this buckle area, the tool doesn't work that way. It cuts indefinitely anything behind it. So if I was to look at this now, you see how it's cut out on this side as well. So Control-Z, I'm going to undo that. <clears throat> you always want to look at it from the lingual. And at this point, usually I'll turn on the tubes as well, because those help me reference where to make this cut. So I can see now my implant platforms, I can see the tubes, and I'm probably going to make the cut right between the two of them, right there. So in surfaces, you've got this cut all button. I'll probably just do these front two. And it's going to cut both models now. All right, and now I can turn it. And remember, I do wanna keep basically the same plane. So I don't wanna orient it like this and do a cut because now it's out of plane with this cut. I kinda wanna lay it down to where it looks like it's in roughly the same plane, maybe right there. And now I'll make the next cut. And then I usually try to slope it up just distal to that last implant. The reason I, I tend not to, to just go all the way back with it is I like to have a little bit of an occlusal extension to help orient it in its seating. Okay, so if I reduce it all the way back, I've lost all that occlusal. 
It's really easy though, after you've placed all your implants, everything's done just to take your burr and just smooth that out. Just make it a flat contour where it nicely tapers. You might've noticed on that first case, any showing that we did, how there's this big ledge of bone because we just did the reduction guide and nothing afterwards. You can taper that out a little bit later. But during surgery, it's, it's helpful to have that. So I need to make one more bone reduction cut. I'll get in the same plane. Here we go. All right, so there's my bone reduction guide. Turn all these implants and tubes off. That's basically it. Now this is something that tends to throw a lot of people. What, what's the problem with this guide? Yeah, the pinholes have all been chopped. That's not an issue. Don't flip out about that because all you have to do to regain those is if I come back over here and I turn the pins back on. So let's show that pin tube and that pin tube and that pin tube, and that pin tube. Now, if I just export these again, with this, then I regain that. Okay, so here's what let's do. Let's go ahead first and go to export data. Don't want nerves, but I do want those four guide tubes. I don't want any teeth checked. I don't want the mandible. All that I want is the reduction guide. And I'm gonna name this reduction guide. Good point. So in these cases, you know, it, it works off an export basis. You, you get charged one per case. So once you export the first thing, all the others are gonna, you'll still say, hey, you've got so many exports, but they won't charge it. Yeah, even if you redesign, once you've exported from that case once, and it's gotta be on the same computer, like you open it, if you did it on yours, it wouldn't charge you again, but if I open it, it would charge me because I've not exported from that case. So yeah, that's a good point. All right, since I'm here, I probably want to go ahead and save that uh, mandible as well. So I'm going to turn everything else off. This time I don't want guide tubes. I don't want the reduction guide. I'm just going to call this segmented jaw. Or no, not segmented, reduced jaw. So what's all that I lack here? I need the, the for real surgical guide, right? So I need to turn on all these guide tubes for the implants. All right, there we go. So now I'm gonna export this and I'm gonna call this the drilling guide, all these surfaces. I'll export data. I'm not making a whole new guide or anything. I'm just using the exact same one. Turn off these pin tubes since they're already on that other. All right, and at this point, I would generally jump over to Mesh Mixer. If you want to know some hacks, do it fully within Blue Sky Plan, I'm, I'll be happy to show them to you. I just don't find them that necessary. Now I could import the drill guide, the reduction guide, um, reduced jaw, all of those can be pulled into Mesh Mixer. Because now what I've got is the reduction guide and tubes just floating up in space. I've got to connect those some way, so I'm going to use that add tube feature in, in Blue Sky Plan to do that. All right, so let's look at the files we've got. There's our reduced jaw. Sometimes you'll have little errors in the mesh and you can just run the inspector and repair them. It'll fix those. Same on the reduction guide. If you have some little errors in this, you can say the analysis inspector, auto repair, and it will just fill those in, okay? That's the right file there. Okay, so here's my reduction guide. Now this could be the point where maybe I want to start trimming this thing back some. So there's my level of bone reduction. 
I didn't have to worry about having a little thin spot because I didn't take this far enough. Now I can cut this back and make it really nice. Maybe using the plain cut feature because you don't need a lot to orient you on the buckle here. Remember, that's not what's orienting you. It's the pinholes that is. So it doesn't have to go super deep down here. So I might just come right across the bottom and get rid of everything below that. All right, I'll accept that. Now it's a lot smaller profile. If I don't want it to be a, uh, you know, lingual portion, I can just cut away part of the lingual. Same over here. And maybe I'll leave that little aspect on the occlusal to index it, but I don't need any of this lingual portion. Okay, so that could now be closed up, inspector, repair that hole that I made. All right, if it's going too far distal, I can plain cut back there, edit, plain cut. Maybe I wanna just go that far back. Plain cut over here, maybe just go that far back. And then just as a last thing that I always do is look at that mental framing and I wanna create a little extra room over that. So I might come in like so and delete that. And delete that. And once again, all that we have to do is repair that hole and it'll kind of have this part that swoops up and over that mental frame. All right. I guess really the only other thing maybe I would do is just take this and trim that contour down some. Delete it. Same back here. Delete it. And analysis, inspector, repair. So if this is really the file I want to be my final reduction guide, then I'm just gonna override it. I'll export it and say, this is the final reduction guide. Do you wanna replace what you've already got? Yes, this is what I want it to really be. All right, and then last step here. The only thing I wanna connect is these tubes. So I'm gonna pull them off. I'm just selecting a little piece of the mesh of each of those. E is that shortcut, expand to connected. And then there's another sh uh, shortcut. If I want to separate, it's Y and push Y. And now that's its own STL. I can get rid of all that. All right, so we need to combine these two things into one STL, because right now there's one of just tubes and there's one of just reduction guide. So control, select, you've got them both and combine them. So you're 90% there, but obviously these are just floating in the air. So the way I'm gonna fix that is with this add tube feature. And the tube function is just gonna have two ends here and I can make it whatever radius I want. You know, if it was uh, three millimeters on one side, or the other, I usually make them like one and a half, two millimeter. And I'm just gonna go through pretty quickly and just add these one from each implant tube to the guide and then one from each tube to the other. Sometimes it's a little bit annoying to use to find that, that red dot, but it's, well, that's what's going to happen, but it's uh, definitely easier said than done. It's kind of what I was talking about earlier, that the difficulty for Blue Sky Plan that we're always running into is there's features like this that I want so bad I can't stand it. And then there's the reality that 99.9% .9 of people will never, ever do this. And so all those little barely used functions end up just being something bigger and bogging the, the program down more. Like, well... Who, who do you try to focus on, the 99% or the 1%? So it's, I'm right there with you. I want them, but that's kind of the difficulty in it. It's what you end up with is Photoshop, where you need a doctorate in Photoshop to know how to, you know, widen your smile. I mean, it's crazy how big that program is, and it's impossible to learn.
So now I'm just putting them one tube to the other. If they're connecting already, then there's no need to add a tube between them. I'm just gonna do that to this. And then the last one would be between these last two tubes. All right, and there is your drill guide. If you wanted to add that extension that Danny was talking about, you know, just for some added strength, you can add one maybe onto the distal here. Not that I know of. Um, it's once you kind of play with the tool, it gets to where you kind of know where it is. But until then, I don't know a simple solution. It's super annoying to initially use this. So that's my final guide. I would now save this as drill guide. And this would allow me to do all my guided drills through this. It pins into the exact same pinholes as the reduction guide because it is the reduction guide. All this other stuff is floating up above. It doesn't touch the ridge. It doesn't affect the fit at all. It's just sitting up there atop the reduced jaw, which is right here. The overlap of right here. Yeah, so I didn't do it because I didn't think anyone would catch that, dang you. But here we go. I see a couple of issues, these two tubes right here. So I could maybe separate them off for just a moment and then shrink them back. Shrink, 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 done. And then to just rejoin them together again, combine. What, I, what just took me 10 seconds will take you a year in mesh mixer to get proficient at. I don't know a good solution for it. I, I wish I did. <laughs> but, but a big part for me has been just learning those hotkeys. They really do help a lot instead of having to manually jump around and do everything. All right, so what's the only thing I'm lacking in this case to finish it out? Yep, I need a provisional, all right? So if I know this is the shape that that jaw is gonna have once it's reduced, and I wanted to make a restoration that sits three millimeters off of that, then I could maybe just select the top of this ridge here and maybe extend it way out. You don't have to be fancy on this. I'm just gonna offset it by three millimeters. So edit, offset. Offset is going to default to whatever the last thing you offset was. I think mine is 0.4. You just punch in the new number. If I want to offset this three millimeters, I punch three, and hit enter. It's going to refigure it. And now you'll have a three millimeter offset jaw. There we go. And I can keep this all as a whole, or I can separate it off and just export this. We'll call it three millimeter offset jaw. I'm going to replace it. And now within Blue Sky Plan, I just pull that back in. File, import STL. Do I need to stitch it when I do? Shouldn't need to, because remember, I've not changed its orientation or anything. In fact, I want it the exact same as it was when I exported it out of the program. So, Apparently I've got too many PowerPoints because that just crashed. And uh, that's a good example of why you would want to save things. But that's a good spot to hand over to Danny. I'll make the, the denture thing tomorrow so you can see that, but it's time for us to switch back. So let's get a two minute break for him to get switched over and uh, we'll get cranking again. Are any though big picture questions on just the workflow? I know it's a lot of clicking and stuff, but I mean, I was talking to you this stuff and we did that. It just didn't make sense for me in my real practice where I can start it out here.
Uh, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> but I think you got the chicken. It's a Cajun one. Yeah. You have a folder on here called Full Arch Guided Course. <clears throat> I think Full Arch. Ah, there you go. Let me click. Got it. Cool. This is that case that Corey um, was going over with upper and lower arch guides with the advanced post segmentation. So we did advanced post segmentation in the maxilla, and also in the mandible. We had six implants on the top, six implants on the bottom. This was the, uh, this is like an overlay of the, the bone, advanced bone segmentation guide for the bone reduction. And then you can see the overlay of the uh, full arch guided with the lateral pin guides and same thing for the lower. This is, you can see the, the depth of the guide tube in relation to the actual, actual bone, all overlaid and layers on top of each other. So there's gonna be several SDLs to print out. So you'll print out the bone reduction guide that's gonna have the vertical stop and the lateral pins, right? Then you're gonna print out, this is for the mandible and the maxilla. So this is the, the mandible. This is the full arch guide for the lower. And then the same thing for the upper. So this is the upper arch and the lower arch for the fully guided kit. And uh, this is surgical guide two resin from Moonray. Uh, Ray's here with the Moonray Pro 95. Thanks, Ray, for lunch. I mean, the, the Pro 95. Thanks for lunch and the snacks. There's snacks and uh, drinks in the back if you guys want anything. Um, <clears throat> If I had a recommended printer, I would absolutely recommend the Pro 95. I think I've said that once or twice. I will say, um, if, you're, if you're using the cure process, so after you've uh, printed these, you don't want them to sit on the build plate very long with uncured resin. You, you would, after they print, you want to take them off and wash them in a two bath with uh, a 90% alcohol or above. And um, after the second wash, you can go to cure. And then I'll always check each one of those things to make sure that there's, there's, uh, it doesn't impinge on the drill guide. So um, the drill is maybe 4.2 millimeters diameter at the largest, but the, the, the diameter of the shank that Corey talked about was five millimeters in diameter. If there's ever any uncured resin that's cured on these little things, it'll hold up on the drills. Or if it has to print with supports, sometimes the supports get 
in around this area. So you just have to check those areas to make sure they're passive before you put the patient's mouth. And then cold cure sterile before use for a patient. So if the diameter of the, the largest is five millimeters for the key, you're not gonna be able to place an implant through the guide if the, if the implant is larger than a five millimeter diameter implant, right? So you can, you can place a three millimeter, a 3.5, a four, a 4.5, a five, but you can't place larger than that because the, the implant will hang up on this guide too, right? So we're, for full arches, you don't need to have a six millimeter diameter if you're using cross arch stability, right? You can, you can go with a five millimeter implant in the posterior region. So this is the, this is basically like an overview of each step by step for the, um, let me get rid of this toolbar if I could hide it. This is full flap reflection. You can see she has lots of bone. This is the occlusal stop of the guide with the lateral pins. You can see it from uh, the facial aspect as well. After the bones were reduced <clears throat> from the facial and the, and the occlusal aspect, and all you have to do is just like Corey said, you just lop this off and take off this last little piece of bone. It's that same acrylic burr that I showed you guys this morning, that round burr. I'll give you guys uh, where it is, where I purchased it in a second. I just do it in the mouth, just, yeah. And then uh, after that's removed, uh, the bone's smooth, profiled. You can come up with a KS7 burr and smooth everything else out again. Then you have to take this guide out and then put the surgical drill guide up in. Um, and every, everybody asked about, uh, are you worried about the buccal bone not being strong enough to uh, hold the guides in? Um, in other words, you drill your lateral pin guides and you put your lateral pins in, right? And then so there's gonna be some pressure on the buccal bone, the cortex, right? Um, and then when you take them out, you have to put the new guide in and those pins back in, right? Are you worried about opening up those holes in the facial aspect and the guy becoming loose or not as stable? Um, I'd be more concerned about that if you're taking teeth out and there's a real thin buccal bone or cortex on the facial aspect. Um, I will say we always, or Corey always tries to get like four on the mandible. If the bone's weak, he'll, on the facial aspect, you can see a thin cortex, we'll go to five, just a half, because I have had some on the lateral pins that um, aren't engaging very well from the facial aspect. But again, sometimes we'll try to get these guys to engage in the lingual cortex as well. So it's bicortical stabilization from the facial and the lingual aspect, right? I'm, we're not perfecting the lingual cortex, but we'll try to like engage the lingual cortex with these pins. So your implants are going in um, through the guide. So they look like right here after the guide's removed, multi is torqued in. Now the suture technique is a lot different because I'm not gonna immediate load that same day. So what I've been doing is a horizontal mattress suture, uh, which I'll, I'll show you guys in a bit. And then I'll have like a, uh, what I call like a sacrificial suture on the occlusal aspects, but they're not draped open whenever they leave. So I'll just put a horizontal mattress suture on both sides and then maybe one in the center, sacrificial suture, or maybe you know one on both sides. Um, just to be held for one day so the patient's not wide open. And then whenever I deliver the provisionals, I'll just cut those sutures, those one or two sutures, and deliver the provisionals. So the only suture that is left is a horizontal mattress suture on both sides. But I'll get to more, I'll get to that in a second. That's a little bit more advanced than what we've talked about. Um, but, it, but the suture technique for full arch guided, if you're doing immediate provisionals, is gonna change from what we talked about. Just remember what I've talked about. Just remember what I said for this case, because if you're, if you're delayed loading the implants just by a day, you're gonna deliver the provisionals tomorrow. Um, you still wanna have a broad band of keratinized tissue around your prosthesis. And the only way to get around that is to do a horizontal mattress with sacrificial um, um, stitches. And I use, no, no nothing, nothing, nothing. They're usually not in pain. I, but in, in the IV, to be fair, in the IV, I get 12 of Decatron and uh, 30 milligrams of Toradol. So they're, they're, they're not gonna be hurting for a couple of days. Same thing for the upper arch, 
This is the, the advanced bone fragmentation. So this, this uh, bone got seat with a occlusal stop. This is after it's reduced, but still holding on to those two things. And then we'll, we'll chop those off and then reduce the bone to the level of the facial aspect. We're not gonna have a lingual. The only problem with the lingual guide, so it, it sits on the facial and the lingual. You just have to have a bigger flap on the, on the, on the palate. And that palatal tissue is really hard to reflect and it's tenacious and it takes so much more time. And it's the surgical time is increased. And so you have a little bit more post-op edema. It's just a little bit easier to, and it's a lot easier to make the guides um, like this. Um, so implants going in through the guide. This is um, uh, the suture technique I, I use for the upper arch, but horizontal master suture is a lot better. So if you're gonna go from, so if, if you have teeth, you know what, I have two PowerPoint, I have two PDF files that I'll, I'll give you guys, but it, it's a step-by-step -step protocol. If a patient has teeth and you're edentulating them and you're gonna go to fix prosthesis and you wanna, you wanna 3D print a conversion, like um, chair sign, in other words, you're not gonna do a conversion of the patient's mouth, right? So you have the wax up already done in Blue Sky BioPlan <clears throat> and you wanna do the conversion over to fixed, but you, want to, you don't wanna pick up your temporary tisalum cylinders, chair side, you don't wanna do the conversion and all that, mat acrylic and blah, 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 blah. Um, there's a technique to scan the patient after the implants are placed and then convert the wax up over to a, a 3D printable or 3D millable file. Um, and you can print that in Vigo resin like uh, uh, Corey was talking about. And Vigo had like A3, and now they have a, a lot of more shades available. But um, you, so what I'm doing is I'm scanning. So I have a pre-op scan of the patient with the dentures after I place my implants, I'll scan the patient where the implants in their correct position. And then I'll overlay both of those scans of the um, patient pre-op, post-op, and then I'll mill provisionals chair side basically is what I've been doing. Um, I, I don't think everybody's gonna buy a mill, um, but cause it's, you know, the cheapest mill you can buy is like $30,000. But um, a printer only, you know, five to $7,000. And you can pre 3D print a very nice provisional chair side for 10 bucks, right? You can mill a full arch for 10 bucks, but you can do it the, just the same thing with the new Bigo resins. Now I bought the mill that I have before Bigo was out because Nextent uh, Crown and Bridge resin wasn't as strong as milled PMMA. And I was seeing better results with milling. So that's why I, I purchased a mill. And uh, Sheldon was a big, proponent of me of getting the mill for my office. But now everything that I do, all my conversions are just are milled for prosthesis and I'll show you what those look like. In fact, this is the case that I did. This was this was uh, this week, I think. <clears throat> so if the, if the patient has teeth, um, just try to envision this for a second. If, if you're taking intraoral scans, you'll scan the upper arch, scan the lower arch, and you'll scan bites. So you have a digital file of what the patient looks like. If you take out all their teeth and maybe keep like one canine or one molar or something like that on the upper and the lower arch, you place all your implants in and you place your scan bodies in place, you can scan the upper and the lower arch and then you can stitch those upper and lower arches back to your original STLs when the patients had teeth based on those two, those two teeth, like the canine and the molar. Is everybody okay with that? So then you have, the, you have your original reference of which you where the patient had preoperatively. And obviously we had photos based on what Corey talked about earlier, the facial planes and you know, correct the midline, correct the cant. The wax, all my wax up are done preoperatively. So I have the pre-op STL scan. Then I've created a wax up of what I really want the patient's teeth to look like. Then I've scanned the patient after surgery where my implants are in correct position with my scan body. Now I just have to tell my software, these are my implant positions. This is my wax up. Give me, you know, essentially give me a 3D milled provisional prosthesis. That conversion time takes 10 minutes in the computer to compute in the software. And then you have a printable $5 prosthesis or milled $10 provisional prosthesis. 
But if they don't have teeth, it's a little bit different, right? Because the only thing you really have to index on the palate is, or the only thing you have to index on the maxillary arch is the, the palate, right? Because that's not really going to change that much. It will once you give local anesthetic and you have some extension to your tissues. But the rugae are still going to be predominant, right? You're still going to have that big nasopalatine frame. So you can stitch those with the maxillary arch. Or you can also take a mini implant and screw it into the palate, scan your, your soft tissue preoperatively, then do your entire surgery, place all your implants. And when you scan your upper arch again, include that mini impl implant back in the, in the upper stitch. And then now you have another reference point to stitch the scan scans together and they'll come out alike, all right? Or you can take your denture and hollow grind out the intaglio surface and reline it to the multi-unit abutment healing caps. And then in mesh mixer, you can invert that mesh. Remember Corey talked about inverting meshes? You can invert that mesh. So instead of being the intaglio surface, it's actually the surface of the scan bodies inside the, is everybody okay with that? I'm getting blank stairs. Yes, yes. So scan bodies are too tall, right? So there's, um, the, but the healing abutments just cover them. And there's a library file for those healing abutments to be used as scan body. Either, either. It doesn't matter the, it doesn't matter the material, it matters uh, the shape and the profile of them. Right, so there, there, there's, there's about 10 different types of multi abutment, healing abutment, shapes and sizes. But I think there's a library for pretty much every single one of them out there right now. So you, so in, instead of, instead of, so I reline this upper denture for the dual scan protocol like Corey talked about, because you can't have the patient having a, a crappy denture. So I reline it for this. But just imagine relining this up into those healing abutments, right? And then you're gonna have a direct index of where all of those implants are and you're using the palate as your seating, right? And you have to do the maxillary first and then do the mandible and the patient's gonna be sedated. You're gonna have to hand articulate them back into the occlusion. And then you'd reline the lower, Is that okay? Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just tug on a little bit harder. Yeah, they're numb. It, you, what you can't do is you can't have an open flap and you can't reline it with an open flap because then it'll get close to the bone. It doesn't matter really about that. It just matters that you're going to get much more scatter in this. Scan. Right, yes. I wouldn't wrap it over the scan body because the scan body has to be super, super accurate, but you could wrap it around, you, you, you can't wrap it on top of the scan body, but around the area, yes, yes. Uh, this is fit check. You can use fit check, you can use bite registration, you can use PVS, whatever you have that's like expired and you don't trust it for Crown and Bridge. Yes, and then you would scan this into Medit and then send it off to your lab and then your lab has all the information they need. They have the bite of the patient, like right here, right? They have the midline, they have the buccal corridor, they have all the information they need. As long as it's a good denture, then it's fine. Then they have the implant positions from the lingual or the intaglio aspect. And then so you can just do a denture conversion and that's, that's it, that's all you need. And I don't, I don't even do this. My dental assistants just have the denture outside the patient's mouth and scan it. That's it. We take the bite scan pre-op before they're sedated. That's the only key because you can't get a really good one once they're sedated or numb. So this, this is the conversion I was telling you about. So this little light blue thing that's missing in here, that's her original denture, right? And so I did a, we did a wax up in the office based off of her original denture design. And if you remove that, this is actually what you have. And these are, all, these are the, um, 
these are the screw access holes coming out. So, so none of them are coming out the facial. This is actually, this one coming out on the bottom, that's coming out from the, the upper arch, coming through the lower arch, okay? And so I just took those off. This is her upper proposed design that gets approved before it gets milled. So this is from the upper arch. And all I said was just whack off the second molars on both the bottom and the top. So I'm not gonna restore her in second molar occlusion. I usually restore her first molar occlusion. This is the lower arch. Once it comes out of the mill after, now the mill time is about an hour to an hour and a half. So this is not gonna be same day delivery. This is next day delivery. You can print this. Ray, how long would this take to print? And, and Bigo. No, all in one. Bigo resin A1. And yeah, an hour for, okay. So you could print the, this upper and this lower in an hour. And I've, I've done that before chair side. Well, basically I've taken all my scans, sent it out to, to 3D print. And then I am packing my PRF, packing some bone, finishing up my suture technique, waking the patient up. By that time, the, the print's pretty much done, clip off on supports, you know, shake it and, and then cure it, and then add a little bit of pink and deliver it. And then they walk out with really, really nice provisionals. This is a decent provisional, and I didn't even do anything chair side. In other words, I'm, I'm pretty much finishing the surgery, and then I walk out of the room not worrying about picking up acrylic or doing anything chair side. This is the upper and lower arch. This, any dentist can do this. I mean, um, huh? This is, I'll tell you the break, so I forgot. But um, th there's a lot of pinks out there. They're not good. This is the best pink that I've used. It's actually, all, all the pink materials out there are all composites. I only buy the flows and I'll take the composite flow in a little tiny brush and I'll, I'll you know, add, you know, like one little tube of, on the facial and I'll just, I brush it down. That's all it is, just brush down and brush it around the whole area. And it, it, it literally takes me like two minutes and I put it in a cure box. I put, actually, I put it in that uh, pro cure box right there and cure it. Instead of taking a light cure and hand it visual, I just put it in that cure box and it cures really well. Yeah. And then there's a material that I'll show you. Uh, it's like a denture, denture lacquer material that I just put on the outside surface. I take another, another um, um, brush and I just brush the denture lacquer and I cure that in the cure box. So go from here to here you know, here to here, obviously. This is the, the next day after. This is her bite. So open and then closed. No occlusal adjustments. This is her before and after. And I mean, is it good? It's decent. Did, did I, am I off a mark? Yeah, I mean, my mid line's off. There's a little cant here, but these are really, really, really strong provisionals. And for moving, for moving eight millimeters of bone on the maxillary arch and five millimeters or eight, seven millimeters of bone on a mandibular arch and not having to do a conversion, not have to worry about this. My, my job right now is done. The prosthetic phase is finished. This photo to the right is all the information that I need to remount the case, fix her midline, fix her cant. I'm gonna keep her in these and keep her happy for three months. She's gonna nitpick these things to death. I want them shorter, wider, fatter, change the color, whatever you want to do. I'll make all those adjustments in these provisionals. And all I have to do for the final scan, for the final prosthesis, is take an upper full arch scan with the palette, a lower full arch scan, and two bite references with the adjustments that I've made, right? Then he's going to import that back into the original file and change the original file to all my adjustments. And then what's the only one thing that I need from now on? The soft tissue, because the soft tissue is going to change. So I have to remove the top and bottom, and I'm going to take a full arch lower scan and a full upper arch scan. And I'm going to import those in to show where the tissues change, and I'm done. That's my one hour final impression appointment. That's it. No matter models, 
no, nothing else. It's just a very simple, straightforward, quick appointment. Oftentimes what I'll do is after we've made any big cosmetic anterior changes, I'll mill another set of provisionals or 3D print another set of provisionals if it's gonna be very short term. If I, have to, if I have a quick turnaround time, like they say, look, I'm gonna be here Monday. And I mean, I've had patients come in from Florida and they say, look, I'll be here Monday, but I gotta leave Friday to go back to Florida for four months. I'll just 3D print them and then try them in and have them walk around it for like a day or two. Yeah, this is good. And then I'll mill it in zirconia, center it overnight, stain, glaze it, and deliver it for Friday. And that's, that's your whole restorative appointment. That's it. So it should be a very sh simple, straightforward appointment. Um, but, but honestly, the, the, the key in all this, going back to what Corey talked about earlier, is just getting the implants in the correct position to make the restorative aspect that much better. I mean, this, this, this is the case that took me an hour and 45 minutes surgically. The, the deliver the provisionals, I, I don't, I, I went in the room to tell her hi, but it, it's, a, it's a very mundane appointment. They remove the, these plastic healing abutments that I leave in the patient's mouth. Shown right here, the girls remove them. They put, they go to put the prosthesis in. If they have any trouble, I'll clip, you know, some of the sacrificial um, stitches. That's it. The prosthesis goes in. Remember, remember, there's PRF around this whole area and the upper arch. And so, so the, the, the upper prosthesis or the lower prosthesis is squishes down the PRF and, and the tissue might be on the buccal aspect and the lingual aspect of my prosthesis, but it's just going to granulate in with, with uh, keratinized gingiva. All right, we'll back up a little bit um, and go back to this case. The only reason why I'm going to show you this case is because if you're still doing denture conversions, because that's what you want to do, this is just a neat technique for the surgical guide, um, implants going in. So, so I prefer tooth guides over bone guides. Um, if, if I'm, if I'm going to stay FP1 or if I'm doing an over denture or if it's just a very simple procedure, you don't have to do the advanced bone segmentation. So I'll, I made this guide, um, took out a couple different teeth. So serial extraction type protocol, put my implants in. You know, I went from this proto protocol for this, for the full upper arch, screw retained provisionals. If you're gonna do the cutback. From the lower arch, it's pretty easy. From the upper arch, you know, you can, you can fill this up with um, that bite registration material I was telling you about. And you can see these little hole, these little things where you can just perforate through those and open them up a little bit and pick up your temporary dicalum cylinders. Right, everybody I'm sure has done that. But for the upper arch, it's a little bit different. What I've done is, you know, in an upper denture, after you've taken out a bunch of teeth, you'll get them in in two weeks and they say it's loose. So you put a reline material in their mouth, coming in like, they usually come in six weeks to see me to take an extra to make sure the implants are healing. I'll put a, you know, the, the denture's loose again. So we'll put another reline material. You know, like two levels of reline material. When they come in in, in 12 weeks for the uncovery and exposure and going to final prosthesis, the upper denture is loose again. And so you have to reline it again to get it, you know, the, the facial plane and everything right. And they have three layers of, of uh, uh, thickness of the provisional material and you gotta do your pickup, right? So if you hollow all that crap out and the denture doesn't seat properly. So you have to reline your denture with any type of material to get it to seat properly. Is everybody okay with that? Everybody following what I'm talking about? Well, um, it was difficult for us at first to be able to pick up those dentures chair side because we just had a lot of material to pick up, right? So what we started to do was uh, we did a wash with bite registration material. And what we do is we put a um, very thin uh, adhesive, tray adhesive on the, the denture itself. And then you put the uh, bite registration material and you reline and have the patient bite down. Right, so they're good, are you okay with that? And then you cut out everywhere there's not tray adhesive, so all this denture is exposed. And then now you can do your pickup on your upper arch with a good firm stop of the palate, right? And then you cut that out and then you cut out your palate, right? Take a final impression, go to final, before and after. I think it's a Burbank 
final restorative case. But again, going back to it, I'm, I'm all about bars now. I, bars are expensive. The bars are about 1500 bucks for a bar. And I only charge $2,000 for a bar. And I was like, man, is there a way to make this a little bit less expensive lab bills? Because again, combined income in my town is $35,000. So um, I design all my bars now and send them out to a lab and have them nibbling. If you send them out to Burbank, it's I think a third of the cost. You can use alien milling if you want to. They're super cheap as well to mill bars and, and titanium. But uh, ask Tony, he's here, ask Tony. But th this is a bar that I designed and had a uh, Burbank mill for us. Um, and so, and the pickup conversion, so the conversion, instead of taking their denture and doing conversion, I just 3D printed denture now and do the pickup with that. So this is a 3D printed denture that is just my pickup in, and I send it off to the lab, have them make a metal reinforced uh, upper over denture. But uh, what's gonna be stronger for the patient, this or this? I mean, obviously, obviously this, right? So the, the bar is a two degree taper on the facial and the lingual. So you'll get support from the bar and these locator attachments are just there to, to lock in the denture, essentially. But this, this has been a, a huge thing for my practice. And, uh, people always talk about medium uh, mandibular flexure. This is based off an article that Carl Misch published in 2005. Everybody all asked about cross arch stability and the mandible and placing implants distal to the middle foramen. So, so, this, so the study states that it can, it can change up to 1.5 millimeters. So 0 0.75 millimeters on the right side, 0 0.75 millimeters on the left side. It's not 1.5 on both sides. So it's, it's 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And that measurement is not taken in the, in the front. It's taken in the most posterior superior aspect of the mandible, right? And that is at its greatest value. So the intermolar distance is up to a hundred microns. So, so relatively nothing. Um, and my, usually, usually my response to them is we've been doing this since the 1970s and nobody's really been concerned about mandibular flexure. Yes, there is some mandibular flexure of the mandible and it's good to know that, but I'm not placing implants in the third molar positions on the mandible and trying to do cross arch stability. That's basically what it boils down to. All right, everybody awake? Let's move on. Corey decided to have a, what did you have? Corey, right before a course that we taught in California, he decided he wanted to have an appendectomy done the, the day before we lectured. So, so the plan was, for us all to fly to California and for our families to spend the day at, at Disney World or Disneyland or Disneyland. Yeah, but Corey felt bad on the plane, had to have an emergency appendectomy. The day of the, the, the morning of the course, I go in thinking I'm just gonna be there by myself given that, cause he just had emergency surgery. He's there. <laughs> he showed up, he, he left the hospital the, the day after he had the surgery, spent the night that night and then showed up before I got to the course and get started out the lecture. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> His speech was a little small. It was actually. <laughs> All right, let's get to this. Um, we're gonna get into, uh, so today is gonna to be about some denture conversions and simple stuff. Tomorrow is gonna to be more about the digital protocol and making all this as simple as possible for you guys, the, the, the surgical aspect and the prosthetic aspect. Um, I would like to show this one case because it does show a couple different things. Um, he was working offshore, he got hit by a pipe, knocked out several teeth on one side, ripped off his, his right ear. Um, was heliported back into Houston where they tried to reattach his ear and then an the ENT took out some broken teeth that were causing some infection. The ear was uh, unstable 
and started to get an infection. So they re-sedated him in the OR to try to uh, fix his ear, didn't work. So then they, a, a couple of days later, they had to go back into the hospital to cut his ear off and then suture him up. But his main complaint was not that he couldn't hear, but he couldn't chew well at all. This was his remaining dentition. Remember a couple of teeth were removed from this side. Um, upper teeth are fine. P three and 14 are periodontally involved. That had nothing to do with the, the, um, the accident at all. This tooth's fractured. Um, this tooth has extensive bone loss from the, from the accident. We talked to the caseworker about it. We could keep um, canine to canine on this aspect, but it didn't have really good bone volume bilaterally on both sides. We talked about trying to keep these teeth periodontally um, with a couple of perio surgeries with a local periodontist to do some bone grafting, try to maintain these for as long as possible. Um, back and forth, back and forth with the insurance company and the, um, the no fault claim case. Um, long story short, they approved for five implants in the mandible, just to remove these last uh, six teeth. Um, he wound up, he was actually at a dentist in Houston um, and they wind up coming to where, where he was initially triaged for the whole accident, but he lives closer to my town. So he wound up coming to see me for that, for the, for the uh, surgery. But I went back and said, I think we could keep these teeth. Um, why don't we try to keep these last six teeth and the insurance company and the family and a couple other people. We had three or four consults about whether or not we should keep the teeth or remove the teeth and eventually decided to go back to the original treatment plan by the Houston dentist to remove the teeth and place five implants. Anyway, long story short, um, this is the intercluedal distance that Corey was talking about earlier. Make sure you measure and have the right height. Five implants in the lower arch is what we treatment plan. Uh, Surgical guide, bone reduction guides, 3D printing and everything. Pre-op and post-ops, this is where we're gonna start. This is where we're gonna level up the bone. We're gonna place five implants. Uh, you can watch this video. Um, I'll show it. This is a little bit faster because it's done with a um, electric surgical handpiece. Popping out these little root tips after it's done. That's what's left. That's, and then I have my second guy that goes on top. Place my five implants. Those are uh, Biomax. These are 4.2s and 5.0s in the posterior. PRF, suture. That's a, uh, this is digitally how much we were supposed to extract. This is a 3D printed version of how much I was supposed to remove. And this is the actual tooth volume that I removed. So just a pre-op um, and post-op of what we planned actually be in the right position. Um, he healed for three months. So we went to expose three modes of keratinized tissue. Cord, you showed you this exposure. Those are again biomax, multi unit abutments in place. Dental conversion, um, day of surgery, PRF, second stage surgery, PRF around the multi unit abutments. And then you're going to screw the prosthesis on top of this. So the prosthesis is going to be screwed on top of the PRF. So the PRF is held down from the occlusal aspect. So the suture technique is you suture after. So prosthesis goes in place and then remember how Corey creates it three millimeters off the ridge. Then you can lance, you can, you can horizontal mattress suture underneath the prosthesis. If the patient pulls their tongue back and this flap moves, then you have to do a single vertical mattress and suture at the midline. That's what it heals like. He showed you the slide earlier. Final impressions. Final prosthesis screwed in place. And we added, we took out these teeth, did some bone grafting, um, but he only had like 3.5 millimeters of bone on both sides. So I wound up doing an internal sinus lift uh, and placing a six by 8.5 millimeter implant, did some bone grafting. Those are the implants in, finally restored. Um, Let's see, oh, occlusion. So occlusion on this is, I always thought that group function would be better function for our patients with cross arch stability because you'd be functioning on both sides. However, I was wrong. The reason why is when you go into lateral excursion, when you have group function, go back into the, the, the um, temporalis muscle is gonna be engaged, right? So you're gonna have more problems with TMJ, TMJ issues, if not. So, 
I've changed from group function back to canine guidance for full arch. Um, interocclusal speed, this is just all uh, occlusion uh, mechanisms. So after I finish that case, there's a pretty, pretty simple, straightforward bone reduction or bone guide, implants placed, blah, blah, blah. I got a call from a social worker that said, hey, you did such a good job with the, the teeth. Would you be able to make an ear for them? And um, this was like a, a Thursday at like two o'clock. I had three patients waiting for me, a hygiene check waiting and a new patient console. And I was walking down the hallway and my dental assistant was like, hey, somebody's on line two for you. And I'm thinking it's a, a physician asking for medical clearance or blah, blah, blah. So I pick up the phone, it's a social worker. Hey, this is a great job. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No problem, no problem, no problem. Yeah, 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 great, 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 great. And I'm just trying to get off the phone as fast as possible. And she said, you did such a great job. Could you please make an ear for him? And I said, yes, yes, yes. All right, good talking to you. Thanks, bye. And I hung up the phone. I kind of walked down the hallway. And I, I thought, man, I think the lady just asked me to make an ear for him. And I didn't even, I didn't even stop to think about it until that night was a Thursday night. I couldn't go to sleep because I kept thinking about this guy's ear. Because the lower arch was it really came out really nice. And um he was so thankful and so grateful, and, and um, he wanted me to make him an ear. So all weekend long, all I did was sit at my computer and, and thought, how could I make this guy an ear? And then um, I think I either watched a Corey YouTube video or something like that, and Corey talked about um, replication and inversion. And I was like, man, what if I, I have a, a scan of this guy, you know, the whole skull, what if I did advanced bone segmentation on this side and then I have a scan of his other ear? What if I duplicated that and then mirrored it in mesh mixer and then aligned it back by the allotragus, then I would have an exact copy of his opposite ear. So um, that's what I did all weekend. I uh, did advanced bone, advanced, advanced bone segmentation of calvarium bone and they had all these mastoid air cells here. And I planned my implants into the best bone volume because he had real dense bone, but it wasn't very thick until you get into the subarachnoid space. And the implants for auricular implants aren't very long. They're about three to four millimeters in diameter, $2,000 a piece. Um, so really this was good down here was really good bone volume, but poor bone density because, and this is a very good prosthetic space, but these mastoid air cells kind of like killed it. So I had the ENT, a buddy of mine came over and he's done surgeries like this before at the Mayo Clinic. And he came over and we plotted out better points for him. And I said, look, I'm gonna give you like eight points, but I need four implants going in. But you figure out day of surgery, which ones you wanna use. And this is the duplication of his ear. It's a mirror image and I built it into a model. And now I had a, a left and a right ear. And then I superimposed that onto the original CT scan. So then I, I could tell where the, the soft tissue would come out for the ear and then where would, which ones, which implants I couldn't use because they'd be out of the housing and prosthetically not usable. So then I made two surgical guides, one bone guide that sits on the bone for the uh, pilot drill guide. And then one was for the soft tissue to make sure that the overlay of the pre-printed ear would actually, uh, we actually be able to use it, it wouldn't be too far out, right? It wouldn't have like a, an extra tumor like we talked about. So I 3D printed this ear for $2.23 and the surgical guides for $1.69. And this was the day of the surgery. So this is the soft tissue guide overlay with the, with the, with the actual guide in place, then the bone guide aligning it with the allotragus. And then all we did was, so the, the surgical guide kit that they had wouldn't, you can't use a pilot drill guide for this because they, they don't have it made. Nobody's ever invented it yet. So we used a surgical marker and once it was aligned with the ear, we just marked all these little holes in here. And it was eight of them. And I said, I just need four, but do your drilling protocol with your, with your in-stop drills because everything's an in-stop drill. And then let me know, um, give me four implants. So this was the pre-op plan physician based on the CT scan overlay in the soft tissue. Um, but the first drill that goes in drops. 
like we're drilling hard bone, hard bone, and then it falls in this place because this was the master air cells. And I was really, really bummed out because I really needed an implant down here. Uh, prosthetically, it's a really good area, but surgically, it's a really poor area. And I thought, um, you know, what do, what do I always do in surgery in a, in a poor area? Well, I'll, I'll pack PRF or I'll pack some bone in that area before I put my implant. So on the drill, we had some extra bone. So I had them pack it in this asteroid air cell and then we placed the implant and took out a 35 millimeters. And then from there on out, we went to place in uh, three more implants and sutured them up. And I actually have a video of this. We can, we can skip it if you guys want to, if you want to see it, I'll let you watch it. Does anybody want to watch it? So the, the implants were called Vistafix auricular implants. This is just beta nine wash. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. So that's the 3D printed ear, and that's the soft tissue guy. Those are not my hands, those are the ENT's hands. That's the surgical marker. That's the bone grafting in the uh, master air cells. Four by three millimeter implant. That implant's $2,000. And it torqued out. So second implant goes in, third implant goes in, fourth implant goes in. All torqued out. The largest implant we placed was a four millimeter by four millimeter implant. Medical, yeah, no rhyme or reason, just medical. So I overlaid the, the, the plan and the, the, I overlaid the plan and the actual implant and he, he used my reference markers, but sometimes when I had an implant between two areas, he just chose to go in the middle and you kind of see before and after what we actually did. I thought it was pretty remarkable, uh, the before and after. One of uh, just publishing this like earlier this year, the surgical and the restorative phase, I try to write the surgical phase up and submit it for publication, but every journal wanted to have the prosthetic phase completed before they actually agreed to it. And then when I actually had the prosthetic phase and the surgical phase and I submitted for publication, um, they were like, wait, you're a dentist? <laughs> so it was very hard to get published as a dentist in a medical journal. But just recently we did, I, I don't even remember the name of the journal. So th this is the, so, so we have the implants in, all that's good. And, well, and we re-sedate him in the hospital and we're in the hospital and we make a full thickness flap, he's intubated. And you, you ever get that gut, gut feeling that you know you, you left your, you, you're going on a, a trip and you left your cell phone at home, you, left, you didn't pack your underwear or you know, your, your charger's not there. If you get your flights or your hotel. Well, I had that gut feeling that I was missing something this day. Um, and, um, I stopped and I was like, oh my God, man, I never ordered the healing abutments for this case. And uh, he goes, don't worry about it. The hospital always orders that in advance. It should be here in the room. So then I went to the back of the room and they had a large box, a Vistafix box. And I asked the lady to open the box. So she opens the box and in that big box was a really small box. So she opens up that small box and there was one healing abutment. So I was like, all right, good. Well, how many more big boxes do we have? Well, nobody, had ordered healing abutments for the case. So then we had to wake the patient back up, send him home, order the healing abutments and reschedule them to be IVC dated again for the fifth time for this year. And I was super bummed out for this guy because he drives an hour and a half to come to my office. But then I remembered when we initially placed the implants, they were internal trilobe and the internal connection was a 3.5. So I, I got out of the OR, called my office, and I uh, asked to speak to one of my dental assistants and I was like, hey, do we have any noble biocare replace healing abutments in the office? And she was like, well, yeah, um, we have, we only have two. I was like, great, that's all I need. So, so she, I, I told her to meet me outside the hospital. So she, you know, she drives to the hospital and I am tearing down the hall in the hospital to get to the elevator, to go downstairs, to get these healing abutments so we can close this case. And everybody's just waiting for me right now, right? And, I'm, and I, without even thinking, instead of taking the, the OR elevator, I go around through the patient waiting room elevator and I hit the button to go downstairs and I 
I, I hear my name behind me. I turn around and it's his wife. She's like, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Everything's great. Everything's great. Grab the healing abutments, go back. And that's how we close the case was, was two dental healing abutments and one auricular healing abutment. And that's how it was closed. So, and I have a quick little video of that as well. See how vascularized the area was? It was in every, all four implants integrated. So, so whenever you place an auricular implant, you always have to place like a sacrificial implant just in case one fails or just in case you have problems, you always have a backup implant. By the way, each one of those, that, that auricular healing abutment is $800 for a healing abutment, $800. So I get a phone call after we close the case because um, the surgery was done towards the end of the month. The hospital said, hey, we used two of your healing abutments for the case closure. We're trying to, and I'm doing this case for free. I have not charged the patient a dollar for any of the surgical guys or anything that I've done up until this point. Um, she said, how much, she said, uh, we owe you for the healing bubbles that were used for the prosthesis. And I was like, don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm not trusting any, anything anyways. And she said, no, we have to build medical insurance. And I was like, look, I got to go, but I'm not going to charge them anything for it. So I hung up the phone and, and I get a call later on that week from the uh, medical billing director asking for a charge for each of the healing abutments. And I said, um, I said the same thing. I was like, I'm not gonna charge him for the healing bubbles. It's not a big deal. It's, I'm just doing this case pro bono. She's like, well, we need this for medical billing purposes. I was like, well, how much was that one healing abutment uh, that we placed? And I brought the other two. She was like 800 bucks. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so we wind up switching out that dental healing abutment for these regular implant uh, healing abutments just so, cause the soft tissue will expand a lot. And, cover our uh, dental healing abutments. We have to put these on. And then what I wanted to do was 3D print an ear in, um, what's the material called? Help me out. Uh, silicone, thank you. But they only have one shade available. Cor uh, Tony printed this for me and he printed it on a carbon printer, but it's, it's only like super white Caucasian nail. There's, there's, there's no shades and you can't shade this down there's too many layers of shades you have to put and it get too thick. And um, I found out that those uh, magnets were $800 a piece and I was gonna buy all the prosthetic parts and I wasn't gonna charge a guy anything and I didn't wanna spend $800 a piece for a magnet if I'm doing this case pro bono. And I remember the case was an internal trilobe connection. And I remember Blue Sky Bio sold uh, locator attachments. And in fact, the magnets are only like one to four up to three pounds of pressure per magnet. So they disengage pretty easily. So I decided to buy those locator attachments from Blue Sky Bio and I just I torqued them into their regular implants. You ever, you ever had that feeling where you're not sure if an implant's healed or not and you go to torque it out and, you're, and you don't want the implant to try to do that on somebody's face? Well, uh, yeah, I'll get it. Man, you're thinking above that. So I torqued in these locators, they, they cost me like a hundred something dollars a piece. I use super snaps from Blue Sky Bio. Has anybody ever used super snaps before? Yeah. They're thicker, but they're more resilient. And you don't have the metal housing. So then surgery success, the placement was success, all that's success, success, but I still have to make them an ear and I can't 3D print an ear. So then what do you do? You call Corey Glenn. So I called Corey and I was like, Corey, 
this is what I have going on. What do you think? And then Corey does what Corey does. Corey's like, all right, send me scans of the soft tissue of his ear with the locator attachments, with this, the quick taps in place, and let me see what I can do. So I took a bunch of photos for him so we could align up the ear. And I, I was thinking about designing a substructure to support, kind of like a, a, a lower arch bar, right? A substructure to support the ear because each individual locator attachments can be so strong it could pull out of the silicone of the ear individually. Then it's just a freaking nightmare. And then Corey was like, what we really need is a good substructure that holds the, e holds the magnets in place or holds the, the locators in place and the ear can wrap around it. So I, try, I tried all different types of materials. Nothing really worked. Nothing was strong enough to invest in, in silicone. So then Corey had the idea of, Corey digitally designed one and had it, laser printed in metal and I just did a pickup chair side on this patient's face like literally put acrylic inside this metal housing did a pickup on it scanned it and then Corey did this Corey designed a, a house around the ear and festooned the ear to encapsulate all of those locator attachments and the bar, because the bar is going to add like another five millimeters. We don't have a lot of room for ears, right? So he goes in a mesh mixer, festoons, fine tunes his ear, digitally makes this a 3D printable mesh and then builds a box around it so that you can actually 3D print this in model resin. And there's gonna be an injection. So to be able to use these, you have to use high heat injection in silicone. And so he made a box that had an input of injection and an output for airflow, and then made it three pieces. Cause you know, sometimes two pieces, they'll, they'll attach real hard. So he put a third piece, once you separate that then the two pieces pull out pretty easily. And then I, after I did my pickup, I sent this, or Corey mailed the model resin, or maybe I did, to the the dent or the uh, anaplastologist in McKinley, Texas. She had never seen me before. She had never met the patient before. She never met Corey before, and she literally did a custom shade based on photos. She snapped this in because this snap. Do you have this in? No. She snapped this into the the negative, and then put the silicone around it, closed it up, put it in a vice grip let it set, cure, cut it out, and ship it to me with the metal encased in here. This is the first time I held the ear. No, I don't know why it's doing it. This was like two years ago. Oh yeah, he came in like two weeks ago. Everything's great. This is the day of delivery. It's the first ear I've ever made. So what happened was we took the ear in the, in the summer uh, shade photos and then he couldn't come in for like three months. And um, so his, his, the color changed a little bit. This is him crying, it's pretty cool. I don't know if you can hear this, but, uh, or watch, watch his face. Cause this is the first time he's taking it off and the first time he's putting it on. Remember magnets are easy to dislodge. This thing, it's five pounds per, locator attachment. And he wants to go scuba diving with this thing. I, I really don't know why he wants to do, do this one. Uh, ah, I don't know why it's doing that. So this first time he's taking it out. All right. Now watch his face whenever he pops it in. Wow, it was so cool. So for most ears to make, they're roughly around $29,000 to make an ear. We made that ear for $3,174.96 and I tracked that because I had to pay for most of it. The only thing that cost me the most money was just this final ear work. I mean, Corey did all the work, really. But she had to do the high heat injection mold with the silicone. And um, her cost is usually $8,000 for prosthetic. I was like, well, 
I mean, how much time did you have? She, she, she called me and she was like, I don't even know what to charge you for it. I was like, well, how much time did you have into it? She's like, well, usually it takes me a day, but it only took me like 10 or 15 minutes. I was like, well, what's 8,000 divided by, you know, and give me that 15 minute charge. She's like, well, my partner won't appreciate it. So I'll just charge you 1200 bucks. I was like, so, so we, we made it near for 3000. It's really cool. And, and this just the, the so the surgic phase, the prosthetic phase, both got um, published just recently. Where am I over time? All right. This is a, this is a advanced periodontal disease patient that I wanna make a bone reduction guide on, um, but I don't wanna have labial supports, right? So you can take your intro arch scans you, and look at, look at the bone loss all the way around. So in a, through advanced bone segmentation, I sent this case out to um, 3D image conversion and they imaged the teeth and they imaged the jaw. So once I digitally extracted the teeth, then you had what the bone's gonna look like after we extract the teeth then you can literally just make a guide on here. It, it, it's that easy. That's what you want to do. So surgical drills. This is the, the teeth being removed digitally. My implants in the correct position. It's your overlay, <clears throat> surgical drill on, on top. Everything 3D printed. Blue sky bile implants in, multi abutments, chair side denture conversion, picking it up. I usually start with the lower arch, always, then the upper arch. Upper arch implants go in. Bone graft, while the provisional is getting trimmed and relined in the lab, or one of the dental assistants, I'm just adding graft and PRF around these. I deliver the prosthesis, then suture. This is what the suture looks like. This is what the suture should look like when it's done properly. You're not getting primary closure. You're getting primary closure around the prosthesis. So this is a no-no. If you're doing a, if you're doing a, a horizontal mattress incision and you have a suture that crosses the midline like this, you have to cut it and, and re-suture. Upper and lower. Final, if you're relining a denture, you can add different metals uh, for dentures, because you know dentures fracture acrylic after you reline it. So there's there's perf grid um, by Elman or Ortho Wire or Corey uses something from Walmart. What is it? Yeah. <clears throat> but this is a, this is the soft tissue on a periodontally involved patient. That, that, that's really really good soft tissue. Upper and lower or upper exposure final attachments. GC pattern resin, you do have to section, not like Prima pattern resin. This is the sectioning, it's the final impression. I did have this fracture off after three months. Final prosthesis, this is that composite Corey was talking about. The problem is you should never do these composite restorations on people that smoke. This was her upper and lower final, so upper overdenture and lower screw retained final before and after. This is why you don't do it on smokers. This is only after like a year. But she came in complaining that she couldn't get it out. It was hard to get it out her mouth. So she was complaining that she couldn't get it out. But see how hard it is for her to get it out? That's the, that's the strength of the attachment. But if she wiggles it, she had a little bit of movement she wasn't happy with, like a little bit of movement. Again, she can't get it out but it's got a little bit of movement up and forth. Now, it, it's usually because the patients are so happy with their fix on the lower arch, they wanna do something on the upper arch. So I wanna make in uh, designing this bar, Burbank milled it. Burbank, Tony, if a dentist designs their bars and you mill them, what's that look like? So, so titanium and cobalt. Yeah. 
with the locators? Per locator. But do you have to design that with it? Yep. Right. Corey, are those, those super snaps putting less pressure on the, the anodization of these things? Because because Tony, really, the issue that I see in practice with the titanium nitrate coating coming off is usually when the implants are divergent, right? It's usually when you have more issues with them popping it in and out because they're wearing on, you know, this side will wear and this side will wear. But not as much as if you had a bar. Yeah. Right. I, honestly, I, Andrew, I. Right. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I told Andrew though. It, I told Andrew though, if you, if you would, if he mills those attachments inside the bar, it would be better if he nitride coated those abutments to improve because titanium is soft. He's going to have some wear on those. So if he's doing it, it would be better to nitride coat his bar. I talked to him about it, but there's not a lot of people that have nitride coating. I said, there's not a lot of people that have nitride coating availability. <laughs> so screwed in place, uh, upper and lower vinyl. So I went from here to here. Look, I stopped doing this against lower arch. 
because you, you can have snaps back here, more retention. Yeah. Hey, how thin, and I asked Andrew this too, how thin, because this, this is pretty thick right here. This is four millimeters in thickness. So, but if, if, if space is, a, 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 is an issue, the smallest you can get is two millimeters. Yeah. Because, because a zest screw is two millimeters in diameter, right? All right, let's see. Right, if it's, if it's an upper locator, over ditch or over, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, but if, it is, if it's anything fixed, where they're gonna have more strength on the mandible, it's always more up, up top. Man, I, I've done them, but I'd probably prefer to do it now just cause I've done, I've, that's like my new thing is just doing more bars, yeah. I, I would rather, I would rather spend, you know, a thousand bucks on a lab bill instead of having an implant fail and coming up and having to replace that implant and way more time and issues. Um, I charge, I don't really, I think the bars cost like $2,000 or what I'm charging the patients. I think that's on my own cost. And that covers most of the lab bill and a little bit left because those locator attachments are, are extra. And look, dentistry is expensive. I'm not trying to be the most expensive in Lafayette. I try to cut corners and breaks as often as I can. One of, my, one of my dental school classmates referred me to this patient. She made this denture for this lady and she was unhappy with aesthetics. She couldn't afford uh, implants, but wanted to get something uh, fixed. And this is maybe two months, three months old, this denture. You see she already developed an ankylitis. Just, this is her smile. So obviously the smile is not right. Um, she has little to no bone in the maxilla, very little bone in the mandible. Um, she's got... This tooth fractured, this tooth needs endo. Um, she, she's got the recurrent decay around here. Here's a recurrent decay issue that I was telling you about. Just a second ago. Um, she needs uh, pretty much apple core caries on all these lower anterior teeth. Um, we talked about um, putting four implants on the top, four on the bottom, six on the top, six on the bottom, six on the top, five on the bottom. We talked about all the different types of things. Um, she couldn't afford six. Uh, and the, the final prosthesis. So I said, look, why don't we just afford the surgery, get into fixed provisionals, wait it out for a year, wait it out for you know, a year and 18 or 18 months and then go to final. Well, in fact, it's been like three years and she hasn't gone to final yet. <laughs> She's doing her provisionals. But um, this is the surgical guide designed for her upper and lower arch. Um, I wind up designing it for six on the lower, six on the upper uh, implants, uh, our teeth removed, implants going in. I want to place in six, um, bone reduction. See all the scaffolding of the irregularities of the bone. This will happen if you're taking teeth out and you're putting implants in and you're going to a certain depth. Um, you'll have, you'll see these threads. You're going to have to graft around those threads in the facial aspect. If your implants at depth for the correct restorative, restorative space, and this is the uh, implant abutment, or this is the implant abutment junction right here. This is the multi unit attachment, and this is the, the, um, the uh, temporary titanium cylinder. 
obviously we graph these areas with bone and PRF around these because I don't want to have any soft tissue tears. See right here. Six implants on the, on the maxilla, upper and lower. I want to, uh, this is the, the primary closure of the my suture technique for deliver the pro provisional prosthesis. That's all the PRF after drawing their, their bone. Provisional goes in, sutured. Um, I loaded the lower. The upper, she was extremely deficient. I think Corey might have this case. We can look at it maybe tomorrow. If not, I'll show it. Um, so I wanted to, uh, want to place my implants, grafting around the, her implants in the maxillary arch, letting them heal for three months, then coming back to expose them. You can see how thin the bone is. I want to regrafting around these. I was doing a denture conversion. And a, a cool technique, if, you're, if you have a denture and you're doing a denture conversion, is you can take your denture and put it in a vacuum form and do a suck down on your denture. And then you get this uh, negative of the denture. And when you expose your implants, all you do is make, you take a, a high speed drill and just drill out the plastic and then get it to seat passively. And you remove this from their mouth and you put this inside the denture and then hollow the denture out instead of putting the denture in their mouth and going back and forth and drilling it out. Does that make sense? Then you have it to the, then you have it so it's passive. This is my bone grafting around the implants, PRF, and the healing abundance. So I lost this implant here, so I want to finish it out with five. Uh, this was when I was doing mounted models and all that crap. Facial photos for aesthetics. This is a Burbank design in three shape. This is Tony's case. Upper custom boat moments, lower screw retained. This is Tony's provisionals. These are really, really pretty. Upper custom abutments in place. This soft tissue from here to here to here. Provisionals in. Again, custom abutments on the top, cemented provisionals, lower screw attained. Before and after lower. This is the upper and lower provisionals. This is her smile before and after. She's been like this for three years with those no provisionals. <laughs> uh, this guy came in for a console. This is his uh, CT scan or Panorex. Um, he came in wearing a members only jacket. Um, he is the piano player at his church. And uh, he only came in because he said when he sings, this tooth moves and he said he's afraid that he's going to sing one day and it's going to fly out during rehearsal so we went over a full treatment plan to take out all his teeth put in six implants top bottom upper and lower fixed you know it's i charge you know sixty thousand dollars for sedation grafting because he the upper arch had no bone so we're gonna have to remove everything, graft it. It's gonna be multiple procedures to try to regain bone, probably possibly sinus lift, maybe a, a pterygoid implant. It's gonna be pretty difficult. The lower is gonna be pretty straightforward because he does have enough bone volume. I, what I usually do is I'll write everything down, like every single thing that I'm gonna do down and I give it to the front office. And if it comes out to like 65 or 67, I'll reduce it down to 60. I don't think it should be more than $30,000 an arch. I think that's just really, really high. Everything, 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 everything. Um, and it, and it, that's for six implants top and bottom with full arch fixed or zirconia, custom abutments or screw retain or whatever. I mean, the most expensive lab bill you can get. I, I still don't think it should be that expensive. I don't, for, for, for cases like this, I usually hire a CRNA that comes in for full arch. It's just a lot to think about, especially when you're doing a surgical guide. You know, mine's focused on the surgery. I don't have to worry about the patient. I've done it where I've sedated myself. It's just a little bit more difficult, especially whenever I'm getting pulled out to go do hygiene checks. And hey, you got a class two amalgam on number 31 on a gagger. It's like, it's too difficult. So I uh, hire a CNA, sorry, they just, they keep him comfortable. So he looked at the, he looked at the lab or the, he looked at the total bill and said, he's just, he's just not going to afford that. He's not going to pay for it. And um, I thought I'm probably going to see him in the very near future. 
This is his uh, right and left side. I mean, just massive amounts of bone loss and destruction. Never once in pain, ever. Um, but he came in like a month later because not during rehearsal, but actually during his service, he was singing, playing the organ, and his front tooth flew out of his mouth. He said it rotated in the air and then fell on his keyboard in front of the whole congregation. He was in the office the very next day. <laughs> so he, he agreed to go over treatment. And I, I use this software a lot. It's called Dental Flash. It's a very basic rudimentary software to help patients understand what we're going to do. This is how many teeth you should have. This is the teeth you actually have. This red area shows where the bone is. This green area shows where the bone should be. We can take out your teeth, do an upper denture, and maybe do fix. If you want fix on the top, you're gonna have to do maybe a delayed loading or place implants later on and come back and do the restorative for the lower arch, for the upper arch. And you wind up deciding to do fix. So we take upper and lower intraoral scans. This is what they look like. Um, this is the bone. I want you to concentrate on how much bone we have in the mandible, but also look at the maxillary bone and see how terrible and how much infection he has. So try to look, try to envision them both. All right, so the second molar, second molar area down here. First molar through and through, mandible. I'm sorry, that was a third, second molar, first molar. Now we're getting to bicuspid area. Bicuspid, this is canine, lateral, central, central. Lateral. Canine, and it's just a massive amounts of bone loss. I mean, this is a quad zygoma case, pterygoid vomer case, or if you're not that guy, then you take the teeth out, you graft, wait for a healing and a denture. Not taking anything. <laughs> right, not even a toothbrush. So plan and plan positions. Um, obviously, I'm gonna work this guide up like I always do for all my other cases. We wanna do fixed. It's probably gonna be FP3 to the bottom, upper arch. This is the wax up superimposed over the actual scan. So I'm doing a, a wax up of the teeth. Uh, Corey, did you do this? Yeah. So this is the bone reduction guide to level out the plane because we had peaks of bone and then we had valleys of bone loss and peaks of bone and valleys of bone loss. So we're gonna place this bone on the, um, and then we're going to have a free full lateral pin guide, hold this, this guide in place to place our implants. This is that burr I was telling you about. Again, it's that hand piece. This shouldn't take a long time. It should be very fast, very efficient. Again, I'll give you all these videos so you can watch it. Take a bath. I never, I never try to touch the guide because that, that burr will cut through the guide. Does that make sense? And I'll come back with a KS7 burr and level it off to the guide. Remember that? So this was the older guy design that we were doing. Obviously the new guy that Corey's been passing around talking about, that's my new favorite guy design. It's the best guy design. It's the simplest guy design. You can see how I'm not getting a lot of good water into this osteotomy. So I'm always having to back up, back up so water can get in the osteotomy and come out. So I usually do pump, pump, come out, pump, pump, come out, pump, pump, come out. And then stepping up the drill to a two by 10. So uh, Corey taught me something actually. This is a, uh, what do you want? What I always used to do is go by, go by width. So 
and then you can stay at one here and then go across. But really what you want to do is you want to go across. So instead of 2.0 by 8, you go to like 2.2 by 11, and then you go up horizontal and back up and across. Does that make sense? <clears throat> See how fast the drill should be though? This is pretty much real time. It shouldn't take very long. This is a 50 by 10 Biomax. No. But then the, the keys are not inside cutting, remember? Because the point that's going to go by is, is that smooth surface. Yeah. Uh, active, yeah. Yeah. I 3D printed the denture for five bucks just to have it. This is a surgical guide, bone reduction guide, implant in. Uh, this implant, uh, when I went to torque out the multi abutment, it turned. So I had to back it out and place one back here. That's what you can see right here. So five, and then I did an extension off of this 3D printed uh, prosthesis and did my pickup, PRF overlaid, screwed in place, then sutured my tissues. This is the upper arch after his healing for two weeks. That's after three months. So now we're going to uh, design the surgical guide. So this is after it's been healing for three months. Good bone right here. This is site like this is terrible essentially, but there's no bone here. The, bone, the implants down here, you can check out. But look, no bone, no bone, no bone. A little bit of bone right here. And then real thin in the anterior maxilla, this is an incisive canal. I had good bone right here, and then good bone here, and then nothing for a little while. And then a little bit of bone way back here. He had a denture in, yeah. I 3D printed in blue sky. So plan my implants in. Denture conversion, upper arch, advanced bone segmentation, using this is different, right? That makes sense. So, so the three D printed resin is not very strong. We all know that. So if you could, if you could print this in metal or print it or in a stronger substructure, or even mill it in zirconia, you could have an, a very strong provisional substructure on top of the uh, the 3D printed prosthesis, especially whenever the bone is that poor, the maxillary arch. So I want to mill in this in zirconia. This is the green state. This is that after it's been sintered. That's what it looks like after it's milled. And this framework will drop into the surgical guide, but also be used for the provisional prosthesis. Corey can go through all that smarter than me. 
So this is the surgical guide. This is for the lateral pins and for the surgical drill guide. Is that okay? All right, so surgical guide and this, this framework that we milled is gonna be used for the implants to go in. And then we can pick up the provisional prosthesis in it as well. So it serves a dual purpose. I'm gonna use this as my uh, lateral pin guide. So we went from here to here, this is with a denture. And I'm gonna bite down uh, and then use my lateral pins. This is the surgical drill guide in place, the implants through and through. Take everything out. This is the subframework of the zirconia, picking up cold curing chair side for the 3D printed denture before and after. This is the framework on a Panorex post op. So I don't have to worry about it fracturing. So he's a little bit too two feet in the mouth in these provisionals. So we're going to scan everything. I think, yeah, Burbank made this upper and lower screw retain. We want to bring them back in remilling these in PMMA, trying the upper and lower end, made a couple more changes, and then wind up going to finals. So those are the provisionals, and that's the zirconia finals. Get through this. This is another case that Periodontist did in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much everywhere I get bone, I, I stuck it. Um, this is a final prosthesis from a, a clear choice clinic in uh, Texas. So I wanna change this, this is the implant after maybe a year in function, I had to remove this multi new bubble and change the angle and then take final impressions. So it came out like this. It's the final lower arch. I got this back from the lab. This is the lab I was telling you back that I wasn't happy with. So I add some, um, do you guys have an oven, a porcelain oven in your office? It's probably one of the best things I've, I've purchased. You know, if you get a crown back from the lab and it's, it's open contact, instead of sending it back to the lab, I just add GC uh, low fusing porcelain in, in my office and cure it. It takes like 12 minutes and are center it in the oven, take it out, pop it in the patient's mouth, and then go to the final crown. It, it's, it's really, really, really simple. Uh, I have a clear. Yeah, they make a CS. You can buy them on eBay for, for nothing. CS just means chair side. It's mostly used for dentists. Now they, they have a lab one that's a little bit nicer, a little bit more expensive. So I bought the CS for our office and I bought the nicer one for the dental lab. Um, and comparing between the two, you really only need the CS if you're just adding contact and simple things. But the functionality of the lab, lab one is really, really nice. Screwed in place. And they want to later on doing our upper arch. This, these implants were placed by a good friend of mine who just had a nightmare. All the implants failed. I went up replacing all of them, going over to fixed. This is, Tony milled this for me, this upper PMA. This is how she came out. It's obviously something off. So we went up redesigning, remilling in PMA, bringing it back in a, a, a good bit. That was her new smile in PMA. So she went from here to here. And it's five o'clock on the dot. You want to break for the day? Zoom back up at 7.45 tomorrow. What do I do, pause recording or stop recording?